secret love child. Writer Mario Daniels, then a 16 year old working on a biography of the Belgian Queen Paola in 1999, casually discovered, oh, the, the then reigning King Albert II fathered an illegitimate daughter during an affair that lasted 18 years. Casual stuff, you know? She was born Delphine Bowles in 1968, daughter of Baroness Sybil del Silis, long champs, and from an early age, Delphine did know who her biological father was. Albert, who she nicknamed Papillon, was a constant presence in her childhood, even taking her on holiday. Though apparently an open secret in royal circles and the reason for marital troubles between the king and the queen, the story only became publicly known in 1999. Delphine had been speaking with Albert her whole life up to this point, who then reassured her that it would just blow over. But then in 2001, his tone changed. He told Delphine he wasn't her father and broke off their contact, leaving her in a state of shock. She eventually launched a legal action to secure recognition in 2012, but it dragged on for years as Albert continued to deny paternity. But when he stepped down from the Belgian throne in 2013, he lost legal immunity, so off the court they went. And it was only in 2020 after court mandated DNA tests proved irrefutably that the former monarch was the father of artist Delphine Balls. Albert was finally forced to acknowledge he fathered a child out of wedlock 51 years prior. And when it comes to siblings, you know what a big deal it is to say, I call dibs? William the Conqueror, the first Norman king of England, had four sons. One died before him, but William split his kingdom between his remaining. Robert, who was given Normandy, and William, who was given the whole dang throne of England. That left the youngest Henry just cold hard cash. William consoled Henry with the prediction that he would one day amount to much more than either of his siblings, who proceeded to make his life hell stealing from him and locking him away routinely. Then in 1100, William, the older brother, dies in a hunting accident. Henry didn't even bring the body back. I'm not kidding, he got on his horse and he went around and galloped to secure the Royal Treasury Winchester before rushing to London where he was crowned on the 5th of August 1100. He was king before Robert, returning in triumph from the First Crusade, even knew the crown should have been his. Robert attempted to take England for himself, but Henry beat him back and then after a few years took Normandy too. Robert was captured and Henry Henry kept him in prison for the rest of his life. Henry ruled for 35 years in total and lost his only heir to the sinking of the White Ship, causing a royal succession civil war called the Anarchy. And speaking of dysfunction, it's the crappy Castiles. Born fourth in line to the throne of her parents, Ferdinand and Isabella, Juana was married off to Philip the Handsome of Burgundy at age 16. When a series of sibling deaths made her the heir apparent to Isabella's throne, her husband confined her, using her mother's death in an attempt to press his claim over Ferdinand's for the Castilian throne. Juana already experienced mental illness before this point and the loss of her mother had been an aggravating factor. Being imprisoned? Yeah, that does not help. After Philip's death in 1506, already known to fly into jealous rages over her husband's mistresses, even reportedly going so far as to attack at least one, honestly same energy here girl, Juana refused to part with her deceased husband's remains for a disturbingly long time and was said to have opened her husband's casket to embrace and kiss him. Juana confinement continued for another decade after her father's regency until he died. Unfortunately, Juana's husband Philip had spread rumors about her madness when he was still alive and her behavior after his death didn't help, so her son Charles, who became the Holy Roman Emperor, eventually took over for Juana as regent and then monarch. From then on, it was him who kept her imprisoned and created a fictional world to keep her isolated. No one actually knows if she was crazy or just experienced depression and lived in an era where men undermined her intelligence and constantly threw distressing BS her way. Next up is two sets of dirty duos. The extreme punishment of a perceived disgraced royal woman stretches back at bare minimum to, hmm, dawn of time. Uh, yeah, we haven't had a lick of peace since men started making rules to say the least. In 1314, the high-spirited Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy, daughters-in-law to King Philip of France, were accused of having scandalous liaisons with two brothers, Philippe and Gaultier Dionne. According to historian Alison Weir, the notorious Queen Isabella of England was the gossip girl who outed her pretty careless sister-in-law as out of wedlock romps, which took place primarily in the Parisian tower called Tour de Nels. Blanche and Marguerite both admitted to their adultery because it was that or death, so I mean, their erasure from public life was swift. They had their heads shaved and they were tossed in the rich white girl dungeon, which isn't that bad. Meanwhile, this is the one time in Western history where the men actually faced a pretty harsh adultery consequence, something usually found in every other area of the world. The brothers had their elephant trunks and boys chopped off while they were awake and alive, and then their nether regions were thrown to dogs, which they had to watch the dogs eat before being brutally executed. Marguerite, technically queen of France upon her husband's ascension to throne, died in 1315, and Blanche, 
languished in captivity, whereabouts barely known, and died in 1326. Modern day monarchy wouldn't be complete without a tax fraud family. 2014, the dubbed philandering playboy king, King Juan Carlos of Spain, found his popularity plummeting. His initial ascension to throne in 1975 had been wondrous, but now following reports of his messy affair and exuberantly lavish lifestyle in the midst of Spain's economic collapse, he abdicated the throne in favor of his son, Philippe. His daughter, Infanta Cristina, stirs the pot, charged with tax fraud in 2014. Although she was acquitted in 2017, she was stripped of her title and left Spain for Switzerland. But it was her husband's turn, I guess, because the former handball champion was convicted on charges of embezzlement, fraud, and tax evasion and sent to prison in 2018. Since then, Spanish prosecutors launched three separate investigations into the former king over allegations including corruption, money laundering, credit card fraud, and kickbacks, though all were dismissed earlier this year due to insufficient evidence, the statute of limitations, and of course, the monarch's constitutional immunity. In a recent case, Sagin Wistin has sued him for using Spain's spy agency to threaten her, and in 2020, he was stripped of a Spanish stipend and went into self-exiled in the UAE. The first, the great-grandmother, an imprisoned princess. Starting in 1682, Princess Sofia Dorothea of Sali was married the basic B-word George of Hanover. She didn't like him, his stupid court, or the mistress that dominated his life, so in 91, she starts her own affair with Philip Christoph von hard last name. It sounds super Scandinavian. They're naturally very stupid, and their love letters get intercepted by Clara, Countess von Platin, who was Sophia's literal mistress-in-law, and Clara tells the whole royal family, who act like a mob, and hire four dudes to kill Philip right outside of Sophia's apartment, in her line of sight. Then they took Sophia's kids away, and told them to forget her existence. They, impri they imprison her at Alden House in Germany, and to save face, Sophia Dorothea is titled a duchess, allowing her to administrate over a small village, receiving dignitaries and other religious figures in her gilded cage, although she was only allowed to walk or ride on short bits of the road. It's said that the notorious hateful relationship between George I and his son George II was the cause of the disrespect towards his mother Sophia. She had died at Alden House in 1726, largely forgotten, and her legend would only resurface a few decades later due to a scandal that swirled around her great-granddaughter, Catalina Matilda of Great Britain, the sister of King George III. Now, the great-granddaughter, Queen of Tears. In 1766, at the age of 15, the daring and eccentric Catalina Matilda is married to cousin King Christian of Denmark, who suffered from being a massive, insipid turd who grew up with untamed anger management and insecurities that made him into a deranged bully as an adult. Christian treated Caroline exactly how you would imagine from that description. He even delayed consummating their union for years, which is wildly unheard of. She traveled alone, no maids or family or rich folk stuff, to Denmark from England, and no one even told her he was a nutcase who would hate her. Yeah, no, by 1770, she was having her own affair with Johann Friedland Strussin, and the two lovers soon scandalized Europe by essentially taking over Denmark, issuing reforms, and infuriating the nobility. Caroline Matilda was riding high, striding through the court in men's clothing, subverting the patriarchal codes of the day. In 772, Denmark's Queen Juliana Maria orchestrated a palace coup, and the increasingly tyrannical Johan is executed in April. Catalina Matilda is banished and disgraced. Her unacceptable conduct convinces her brother George that he could not welcome back this criminal sister into the English royal family. Ripped away from her children, she is sent to Sel Castle in Hanover, and like her great-grandmother, put under a sort of Gentile house arrest. Unlike her great-grandmother, she is allowed to walk through town, earning praise from commoners for her kindness and charity. Because it doesn't count as a crime if he did it to himself. Most of the information we have about Crown Prince Saito, born in 1735, comes from the wife's autobiography, Queen Hyageon, written in 1805. She recalled what happened as his disease progressed. Prince Saito's mental health further deteriorated by 1757, following the death of the queen and his adopted grandmother. To release his emotions and frustration, Saito began to beat the court eunuchs and staff. When that wasn't enough, he began to kill. Here's what his wife's account was of that. The first person he killed was Kim Hachia, the eunuch who happened to be on duty that day. The prince came in with the severed head and displayed it to the ladies in waiting. The bloody head, the first I ever saw, was simply a horrifying sight. As if he had to kill to release his rage, the prince harmed many ladies in waiting. I suffered so for this. His illness seeped deeper and deeper. Now that he was killing people, our quarters became a house of horrors in which no one could be certain that they would not fall victim next. 
attacks. Eventually, Prince Sato kills his favorite mistress and threatens his own sister. In 1762, realizing the disgusting conduct would ruin the Korean family, his mother appealed to his father and they had to eliminate their own child. Since tradition dictated that, that his wife, Lady Hia Jong, would have to die as well as their son if they punished Prince Sato, the king came up with a bizarre solution to safeguard the daughter-in-law and heir. On a sweltering day in July, the king forced Sato to step into a rice chest that would then be locked. So that way, technically, the disgraced prince had caused his own death. He died eight days later. And I can't even give you a funny title for this one because it's just a lot. This is the Crop Top King. King Maha of Thailand, crowned in 2019, is a philandering train wreck hot mess. When his third wife dumped him, he tossed her parents in prison for two and a half years for royal defamation. His earlier two marriages were equally rocky. He allegedly fathered five children with a mistress during his first marriage to his cousin and then married said mistress. Later he dumped her and made her flee the country. When he was crowned prince, taking a page from Caligula, he appointed his pet poodle Fufu to the royal air chief marshal, then held four days of Buddhist funeral rites when the poodle died in 2015. He even took the pooch to a 2007 reception hosted by his honor, the US ambassador Ralph Skip Boyce. Then there is the 70 year old king's fondness for wearing crop tops and temporary tats. Check out this sick pic at an airport in Munich, strutting his stuff with a rolled up tank top, sagging jeans and fake tattoos with the poodle in tow. Call this king a queen cause he is serving. Belly bearing vests have become the garment of choice for many young Thai pro-democracy protesters in rallies in recent years. They are looking to limit the powers of the king who has become the richest monarch in the world, partly by amassing personal control of an estimated 43 billion in royal assets in 2018 that were historically overseen by an agency meant to manage the money for the benefit of the Thai people. His response for this was to ban crop tops. In July 2019, two months after the king married his fourth wife, his longtime mistress Sinyat was made a royal consort in hopes of getting her to shut up and accept that he'd never marry her and make her queen. Two months later, because this didn't work, he strips her of her titles, tosses her in jail until she can learn to behave, and after 10 months, she's released back to his custody for about, only for about, mmm, 2,000 explicit images of them to get leaked to the entirety of the Thai community in a cyber attack, and everyone sees these guys, they're explicit. Obviously, I could keep talking about this guy and his gross scandals forever, there's no shortage of them, but instead, we'll stare at these airport photos again, because man, what the hell am I seeing here? Legal back. The best example of this is one-way ticket. If you've watched some of our other Pharaoh videos before, you may know the reason their tombs are so packed full of art and treasure, but also carriages and beds and forks and snacks. Genuinely just random living equipment is because the Egyptians ran on the belief that after death, you continued to live life. So you need all the stuff that you had in your regular life if you wanted to maintain your comfort and not have to rebuy or rebuild everything. So if you're an everyday person, yeah, they may toss your toothbrush and your teddy bear in there, but pharaohs were used to a more personal, larger commodity. People, servants and concubines and serfs, so all of these people were considered possessions as well. So if the pharaoh died for a super long time, they'd quite literally mass kill his whole staff and toss him down there in his tomb. For example, one of the very first rulers, King Aha, supposedly died after being gored to death by a hippo. To accompany Aha to the afterlife, some courtiers, retainers, and slaves downed poison and were buried with him. Sometimes, if the rumor is true, these peoples would also simply be sealed into the tombs alive. Fights to say crime, very big crime, very big crime, 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 crime. While that wasn't a big deal then, however, the Trishrata agreement violations was. Trishrata, the king of Mitadani, who was another close ally of Egypt, had given his daughter's hand in marriage to Akinsaten, the father of Amenhotep, aka King Tut. Upon his father's death, the young pharaoh married the Mitadani prince princess as well, making her one of the lesser wives. Let's be real, Nefertiti had homeboy's heart, soul, and boys in a chokehold. Trashada sent Akhenaten many letters to protest the fact that he'd never received the agreed upon bride price of solid gold statues and instead had only been sent gold plated wooden ones. Cheapos. The pharaohs didn't avoid all diplomatic matters, just the ones they didn't personally entrust him. His attention was primarily focused on religious reform and life within his palace. This Persian pharaoh was a known prick and animal hater. The Persian son of Cyrus the Great, after Cambyus' nation conquered Egypt though, he was put in charge of that country. And so he was the ruler of Egypt 
and apparently someone who hated animals. This is the psycho who strapped cats onto shields to gain entry into Egypt, put on fights between lion cubs and puppies, and once killed the sacred apis bull, a literal crime in ancient Egypt punishable by death. When Cambyses returned to Memphis after an unsuccessful military campaign in the south, Apis's new reincarnation happened to appear in Egypt the same day, which is a massive call of celebration. When Apis appears, the Egyptians all at once don their best clothes and they hold a festival. Seeing this, Cambyses is convinced they're celebrating his misfortunes, so he summoned the rulers of Memphis and demanded to know why the Egyptians were behaving this way. They answered that a god had appeared and it was custom for Egyptians to rejoice that occasion? Cambyses is unconvinced though and claims they're lying and has them put to death. He then next summons the priest, who told him the same thing when he asked. He replied that if a tame god had come to Egypt, he would know about it. Then he ordered the priests to bring Apis before him, which they stupidly do. When the priests lead him in, Cambyses draws his dagger and stabs the bull. Laughing at their screams of horror, he said to the priest, are these your gods, fools of flesh and blood who can feel the bite of iron? This is a fitting god for Egyptians, but I will teach you to make a laughing stock of me. He then ordered all the priests swift and any other Egyptians celebrating to be killed. So the festival ended and the priests were punished and Apis lay in the temple until it died and they had to secretly bury it. This was arguably kinda a crime, kinda not. It's Cleopatra, sibling annihilator. And she is nowhere near the only one. Egyptian pharaohs loved to smoke their own siblings, kids, nephews, to, to ensure any kind of throne claim. That's why, yeah, it was a crime, but who's gonna do something about that? And what can you do that won't make you the next coup victim yourself? Power grabs and murder plots were as much a Ptolematic tradition as inter-sibling marriage, and Cleopatra and her brothers and sisters were no different. Her first sibling husband, Ptolemy the Bajillions, ran her out of Egypt after she tried to take sole possession of the throne, and then the pair later faced off in a civil war that she won by shacking up with Uncle Caesar. Ptolemy then drowned in the Nile. Following the war, Cleopatra married her younger brother, and she is believed to have killed him not long after as the marriage was just to ensure her and Caesar's son, Caesarian, was next in line. In 41 BC, she also engineered the death of her sister, Aronso, who was considered a rival to the throne. See, I'd say a bunch of killing coups. That's a crime. Nothing like a klepto gaslighter king, though. Amasis' crime was literally being a petty thief. Absolutely zero yard cred for that one. Dude was a raging alcoholic, nympho, and made it to the throne by being sent to calm down a rebellion, but instead chose to join it and lead it, overthrowing the pharaoh and earning him his throne. Ever a master of tact, he sent the king his declaration of war by actually lifting his leg and farting and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He's that guy. But what was most hilarious, at least to me, was the fact he's a maniac that would steal his friend's stuff, then put it in his house, invite those friends over intentionally, bring them to the room where the item was, and then try to convince them that they'd never owned it in the first place once they'd seen it. This is the single most frat boy personality I've come across in ancient times anywhere, and it's glad to know that it actually does come from somewhere. By making religion illegal, he was defying the laws of the gods, Akhenaten's monotheism. Intentionally erased from history until the 19th century, Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten established the first known monotheistic religion called Atanism, which was rediscovered in the late 18th century and integrated by by the 19th and 20th centuries religious philosophers into the histories of the three Abrahamic religions. During Akhenaten's first years as pharaoh, he did recognize the existence of other gods, even though Aten was his primary patron deity. There exists iconography from early Akhenaten's reign where he was still Amenhotun of Aten, and that includes images of the other solar gods. However, those scenes of Aten sharing space with other gods soon disappear in later depictions, and some of these iconographs of Aten alongside other deities are defaced a few years later after their creation. Additionally, any mention of Akhenaten's old name, Amenhotun, was also hacked out. Akhenaten would eventually officially proclaim that Aten was the one and only god, and he condemned the worship and or acknowledgement of any other deity, going so as far as to remove their names and effigies. This actually led to Ak's condemnation of memory, a practice reserved for scrubbing unlikable people from history. By imposing these laws, he defied the universe's laws and those unspoken of freedom of religion in them. Womp womp, y'all ain't gonna like this one. It's it's puppy mills. Very legal, as they should be. Your reminder to please go to the SPCA and a charity and adopt one of those adult animals or rescued baby animals rather than financially feed a puppy or kitten mill because you want a fancy breed. But back in ancient Egypt, they were not only incredibly necessary, but also, well, common dog. Is it okay to use that right now? 
In Saqqara, researchers have discovered burial sites filled with a huge number of mummified animals, nearly 8 million of them, and most of them are dogs. The catacomb in particular is one dedicated to the jackal-headed god Anubis, who represents the afterlife. Archaeologist and Egyptologist Salma Ikram writes that the animal mummification began in ancient Egypt to allow beloved pets to go on to the afterlife as well, to provide food in the afterlife, and to act as offerings to a particular god. Nowadays people go to church and they light a candle when they want some godly handouts, but the Egyptians were in for the long haul. One little flame isn't enough, so instead they would offer a mummified dog. To get a mummified dog, well, Ikram says the huge number of mummified dogs implies if not completely confirms the existence of ancient Egyptian puppy mills. As quote, you don't get 8 million mummies without having puppy farms, and some of these dogs were killed deliberately so that they could be offered. So for us, that really seems heartless, but for the Egyptians, they felt that the dogs were going straight up to join the eternal pack with Anubis, and so they were going off to a better thing. 2,000 years later, Alex is facing his crimes. During his stay in Egypt, Alexander the Great was proclaimed the new pharaoh. He received historic titles associated with the position such as the son of Ra and beloved of Amun. Whether Alexander also received the elaborate coronation ceremony at Memphis, however, is debated. But what won't be is him being on this list. Fight me all. Although he was in control of Persia by 330 BC, a very drunk and very angry, he stripped royal treasuries as he went through the country and captured Persia's capital, Persepolis, burning it to the ground in a final act of revenge against Persia with all the treasures inside. Alexander the Great's Macedonian army then pillaged the city, destroyed the palace complex, killed almost every single civilian, and then violated and stole the women. So, 2,377 years later, on the 26th of October 2022, Alexander the Great stood trial for war crimes at the UK Supreme Court. He was charged with four counts of violation of laws and customs of war during the raising and conquest of Persepolis. The prosecution argued that Alexander was a war criminal who committed atrocities at Persepolis as a deliberate political act. The defense argued that the burning of Persepolis was not politically motivated, rather it was merely tragic consequence of his drunken behavior. And shockingly, the jury acquitted him on all four counts of war crimes. The verdict surprised Lord Legat, the Supreme Court Justice presiding, after the jury chose to judge the defendant by the standards of his own time rather than the modern customs of war in the annual classics for all moot trial. I cannot help but feel some regret that you found deliberate extermination and enslavement not to be war crimes, but so be it, Legat said. Now for something that was a Grecian no, but in Egypt it's a yeah, sibling relations. So it, the Egyptian pharaohs wouldn't be breaking any crimes, but with the Polytamic Dynasty when they came in, they were Macedonian Greeks from a land where it was very much a crime to be doing some stuff with your siblings. It's also very much a crime by today's standards everywhere but Alabama. So the Ptolemies adopted this practice from the Egyptians whom they'd conquered, although this would ironically exclude the native Egyptians. The tradition of sibling marriages appears to have begun with Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who married his older sister Arsenio II. The epithet Philadelphus actually means sibling lover, but they kept it clean. It wasn't until the union of Ptolemy III and Arsenio III that this custom of interfamily marriage resulted in the first birth of an heir. All earlier heirs to the Egyptian throne in the Ptolemaic dynasty had been from the side wives. As noted by historian Sheila L. Agar, the Greeks clearly believed that interfamily relations were repugnant not only to the gods, but to all right-thinking individuals. Given that the Greek literature sees it as one of the greatest taboos, things did not turn out well for Oedipus after all. There has been a protracted scholarly debate as to why the Ptolemies engaged in it. One of the primary explanations is they were influenced by the local culture. However, the practice of sibling marriage may have also bolstered their legitimacy as authentic pharaohs in the eyes of their Egyptian subjects. Despite this, even though other Greek families had moved to Egypt were also marrying cousins, there is a tendency to blame the Egyptians for the Ptolematic you know, issue. Now, it, the insane way in which Cleo learned the toxic limits. Alexandria became a prestigious center of learning and the first medical center of the ancient world. As the last member of the Ptolematic dynasty, Cleopatra inherited the throne, but also the great inclination of the Ptolemies towards medicine and science. Attracted by knowledge of venoms and poison, Cleopatra began to test them on condemned prisoners to see the different reactions produced in the body and found 
known toxic limitations. By tricking or directly forcing the prisoners into testing these poisons and mixes, Cleo learned oral poisons would cause disturbances such as painful spasms, nausea, abdominal cramps, and slow ends. She even had set snakes on prisoners in order to compare the major effects of venomous snake bites caused by the various species in Egypt, such as vipers or elephants. It has been said that Cleopatra used the cobra to take her own life because it would also make sense in some Egyptian mythology, being associated with the sacred uraeus worn by the pharaohs. However, there are several problems with this theory, and some scholars argue when she decided to take her life, using the information from testing these poisons, she would use a poison that would make sense, that given the possibility to choose the best one, to have a quick and relatively pain-free death. We're gonna start with peace treaties. Egyptologists know Ramses II as the pharaoh who restored Egypt's relations with Syria and built a lot of neat temples in the desert back in the 1200s BC. And he's the one in that Disney movie whose first son gets smoked by the plague. Kind of a wild guy, so we'll talk about him quite a bit in this vid. Anyways, for over two centuries, the Egyptians fought against the Hittite Empire for control of lands in modern day Syria. The conflict gave rise to a bloody boot down, such as the 1247 BC Battle of Kadesh. But by the time of the pharaoh Ramses II, neither Either side had emerged as a clear victor, and this was just becoming all drawn out and bloody and just plain stupid, especially with both empires facing threats from people outside each other. But who's ever gonna be the first to wave the white flag, let's be real, when it comes to two dudes, y'all are notoriously known for just beating each other up, shaking hands, and best friends again. So in 1259 BC, the two said, ah, to hell with it, let's do lunch, and Ramses II and the Hittite king Hatsu Sili III negotiated a famous peace treaty, one that was either the first known in creation or one of the earliest ever. This agreement ended the conflict and decreed the two kingdoms would aid each other in the event of an invasion by a third party. This treaty is now recognized as one of the earliest surviving peace accords and a copy can be seen above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council. How about some ancient Egyptian body dysmorphia? Because bodies are supposed to look like this, right? That's what Akhenaten was probably wondering and it must have been awkward as hell for fine as silk queen Nefertiti and normal looking son King Tut to try and lie their way through any reply to that. Because this whack job was known for two things. For Firstly, as to force monotheism on Egypt so brutally that when he died, his son had to awkwardly erase his legacy. And secondly, he was one funny looking dude. He had an hourglass figure like a BBL baddie, an elongated head with a square jaw jutting out, big curved almond eyes, and let's say he could have filled out a bra better than me. So, Egyptians like to play Photoshop with their selfies the way we do now, and the first depictions of Ak, his body and head are normal. But after he forced monotheism, that literally destroyed the economy and empire, his gender and sculpture and carvings became more ambiguous. Three explanations. First, he's the most hated pharaoh in history. So I mean, come on, artistic license, get some anger out. Second, perhaps his changing appearance was metaphorical, meant to portray Oct as the father and mother of all humankind. Third, is that it was a genetic disorder, such as amitrace excess syndrome, where the body released equal levels of both hormones. But we all know what the likely one was, seeing as these guys could quite literally not keep their hands or really any appendage out of their family members. I'm not gonna lie, I can't handle having eyeliner on for three hours that me and my roommate go out. Meanwhile, the pharaohs had obligatory face beat like they were working at ancient Sephora every day. Early Greek traders who visited Egypt were astonished by the sophistication and precision with which Egyptians took care of their skin and hair and decorated their bodies. Europeans remarked that almost everyone was wearing makeup, even in public places, and that'd be accurate as both men and women were known to wear copious amounts of the stuff, believing it gave them the protection of the gods Horus and Ra, who were always fighting or banging each other and doing so in a full face of makeup like some spectacular fursuit wearing drag queens. The only distinguishing factor between men and women's makeup was that men's makeup was simple while women's was often heavier and more complex. The distinguishing factor of all makeup, however, was wealth. Nobles could afford the fresher or less diluted products, while lower status had to use makeup from poorer quality materials, which sucks since they worked in the sun all day, and higher quality coal you lined your eyes with, the better it reduced sun reflection. This act will also protect them from evil spirits and eye diseases, as they believed their makeup had magical hearing powers, and they weren't entirely wrong. Research has shown that lead-based cosmetics worn along the Nile actually staved off eye infections. All right, you annoying ancient astronaut people, this is for you, Tut's space knife. I am not sitting here doing the work for y'all, pretending we all don't know who 
King Tut is. He was the child pharaoh, smoked by a hippo bite, cursed tomb, blah, 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 blah. So we're just going to get right to it and say he had a knife literally from space. Specifically, a small dagger, but whatever effing y'all, this thing is so sharp. To this day, the TSA would tackle you sooner than let you board anything with it. They found it in Tut's tomb in 1920s with all that other magical treasury hunky-dory that they stole out of there, and it was originally believed to be forged from the iron heart of a meteorite. Originally, ah, keyword, see, Egyptians didn't have the ability to smell. They weren't actually suitably advanced in that realm. So they especially wouldn't be able to forge a weapon from space metal, let alone crack open a meteorite to get to it, or know that was even an option. This has led historians to presume that the dagger was a gift from a foreign nation that did possess smelty technology. While historians are pretty confident the foreign nation wasn't the Martians, they haven't explicitly ruled that out either, so I guess those ancient alien guys might have a point. If you like stuff like this, check out our top 10 alien hieroglyphs found in ancient history video. The story of how two pharaohs throw down over pet hippos. So, Pharaoh Sekinenri Teo, I'm gonna call him Sek, the second, kept a pool full of pet hippopotamuses, letting his massive pets splash and play all day. Obviously, you don't get close because these are blind rage death animal machines, but this guy loved his hippos so much he could kill for them. He was willing to die for them. In fact, he literally did just that. This is back when Egypt was divided, and the most powerful Egyptian kingdom was called Hykos, which was ruled by Pharaoh Apopi. Being a lesser king, Sek was required to pay tributes to Apopi out of respect. He could handle the humiliation of living under the tyranny of another man, RIP fragile male ego, but as long as a poppy didn't rub it in or act like an ass about it. So that's exactly what a poppy did. He went right for the sore spot by telling Sek to get rid of his hippos. Apparently they were too loud and a poppy couldn't sleep at night in his own house that was 750 kilometers away. Yeah, no. Sek says, hey, I can handle you bullying me constantly, but leave the hippos out of this. And he would not tolerate any further insults to his hippos. This, he declared, was grounds for war. That's what they did. Sek even died in combat, fighting for his right to a hippo pool. The war didn't end when he died, however, his son kept it going. Two generations of kings fought for a hippo pool, and in time, they won. By the end of the war, Egypt had unified once more. All because of one man's love for his hippos. And speaking of, after that unification happened, it paved the way for the royal trendsetter Narmer. Because before our boy Narmer came along, the red crown of Lower Egypt and the white crown of Upper Egypt were worn by the pre-dynastic kings. Narmer was famously the first king to be portrayed wearing both crowns symbolizing that union. This would later be replaced with the striped crown, a continuous representation of union called a nemesis. Adorning the top was the uraeus, an upright cobra that symbolized the ancient Egyptian goddess Wajet, meaning the pharaoh was ready to strike his enemies with deadly venom. Trendsetter Narmer doesn't stop at crowns, he's the first ruler to portray themselves in a royal beard, which every Egyptian pharaoh wore afterwards, whether man or woman. Then there's Narmer's implementation of an official who has the most important task of carrying the pharaoh's magic sandals. Egyptian pharaoh's sandals were the only piece of clothing that separated them from the land of Egypt and rightfully symbolized the union between the heavenly god world and the earthly human world. King Tut's sandals were famously inscribed with pictures of his enemies. Meaning with every step, he was crushing the enemy's Egypt. In the famous Narmer palette, he's also seen wearing a fake bull tail, which symbolized strength to rule the country of the Nile, but that trend didn't stick. Hey, so Ramses has 50 lost daughters. What a crappy dad, doesn't know where all his kids even are. Kinda of understandable when you have 102 of them, with about nine women, however. Made possible by somehow living to be 91 in an age where people died at like 20. Suffice to say, he had lots of leisure time. Of course, not all the children were children at the same time. Ramses II began his family long before he took over as king, and he reigned for 66 years. He spread the brood out over most of that time. So archaeologists announced in 1820 they uncovered a tomb built by Ramses, and that 52 or so of his sons happened to be in it. They finally recently started excavations after a few decades, and now we know that the mausoleum is the largest and most complex found to date in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, with at least 62 rooms. But Egyptian kings normally didn't build mausoleums for their offsprings. Their principal wives, yes, over in the Valley of Queens, but their kids, no. If it turns out the only Ramesses' sons are in the tomb, where are the 50 daughters? Sexism can answer that. Males were regarded as potential heirs to the throne, and the princesses were not, so they weren't held in high esteem and didn't get a fancy resting place. Doesn't mean they didn't have value. Ramesses designated at least three of his daughters as princess queens. Woo! No? No. Oh, no. What that suggests isn't pretty. But what isn't known is whether or not they were actually married to him and, you know, producing, or if the title was a way of honoring selected daughters from tertiary wives. Historians, however, are pretty confident. 
confident on which one it is. This would be the end of the story, but for a single question. Why would a latex protection manufacturer name its product for a man who had 102 kids? Are you choosing cats or your empire? In Egypt, the penalty for killing a cat was death. This wasn't just a law against cruelty to animals or sadistic Friday the 13th butchery. All you had to do was accidentally run over a cat with your chariot and you're done. This is mostly due to the animal being closely linked with the cat-headed goddess of warfare and balls of twine, Bastet. They were also revered for the role they played in protecting food stores and homes from disease by killing pests like snakes and rats. Basically, pharaohs coined the three laws of robotics a millennia before Asimov and used them to protect the thing that poops under the stairs. And I and don't think there are exceptions. One writer, Didorus Siculus, even recorded that the king of Egypt himself personally tried to intervene and save a Roman man who had accidentally killed a cat. His people did not give a single F, however, ignored the ruler, showed no mercy, caring literally negative a thousand if it meant risking war with Rome. They formed a mob, hung him, and left his body in the streets while the pharaoh sent a real awkward fruit basket apology to Rome. Perhaps the greatest example of a pharaoh placing the well-being of cats above that of his own people, however, was Pharaoh Pismatic III literally told his army not to fight the Persians' advancement because these smart little twists had painted the image of Bastet on their shields and marched behind a line of dogs, sheep, and cats. In their words, whatever animals the Egyptians hold dear. The Egyptians, under threat of death from the pharaoh, had no choice but to let the Persian ruler walk straight into the city unchecked. He then murked anyone who dared to challenge him, using the shields with cats drawn on them because you can't even strike an image of a cat in ancient Egypt. Cambyses, the ruler's name, celebrated in a dignified noble fashion, marching the Egyptian armies past him as he threw cats at them and screamed insults at their gods. We aren't 100% sure who the first pharaoh was, but it was probably Catfish Chisel. The only way we know the lineage for early Egyptian kinship is the highly damaged Palermo Stone, which was a black slab of granite carved full of the names of kings up to the 5th dynasty. The part of the stone where the first and second king of the 1st dynasty is inscribed is bust to clean off. Although it is generally accepted that the first king was Narmer, aka Menes. The second one was Aha. Even without enough evidence to prove beyond a doubt I can't get past the Aha thing. The name of Narmer is composed to two ideograms. The catfish reading as Nar and the chisel reading as Mer. The location of Narmer's body has eluded archaeologists for two centuries now. The first Egyptian pharaohs used to build a type of tomb called a Mabasta and they did so until the third dynasty when they started busting out pyramids. It's theorized Narmer is in one of those. But then Egyptologists have discovered a large field of pre-dynastic and early dynastic royal tombs in Umakab, and the Narmer's name is identified in an inscription found. However, this is Egypt. The site had suffered disturbances, tomb robbing, and disrest for the past 5,000 years, making it impossible to know which one of the bodies is the precise tomb of Narmer. To this day, archaeologists and Egyptologists disagree on whether Narmer was buried at Saqqara or Um el Kab, and in the end, his cause of death isn't even fully known. Just that of a philosopher in Mantheo saying the reign of Narmer ends when he was carried off by a hippopotamus and perished. And last but not least, believe my eyes. Even though it may be a lie. Who knows? I don't, but I love a good rhyme. While it was likely a disease genetically inherited in his DNA, the official Egyptian story is that Pharaohs was cursed by the gods with blindness. Apparently, when the Nile was flooding, Pharaohs got fed up with it, and instead of letting the water do its thing and calm down, he chucked a spear at it. Because yes, throwing a spear at a river would probably change things. For his insolence and stupidity, the gods struck his ass blind. Pharaohs vibes this way the best he can for 10 years before he meets an oracle that either wanted to pull history's most hilariously mean prank or genuinely believed the gods had passed on this message. But the oracle tells Pharaohs all he's got to do is wash his eyes with the urine of a woman who's never slept with any other person than her husband her whole life. Okay. Well, Pharaoh isn't asking questions. He's here for solutions. He finds his wife and says, babe, I want to spice things up in the bedroom. I have an idea. And the two of them give it a try. Only it doesn't work. So now he's still blind and his wife has some explaining to do. Before she does that though, Pharaoh needs some more urine and he needed it now. So every woman in town is gathered up and given a pot, which he then sat there dumping its contents into his eyes one after each other. No, I don't know if he waited for it to cool down. I do know it was probably the color of French's mustard though, seeing as Egyptians literally only drank warm beer. So imagine. But somehow Pharaoh finds the one who's not cheating on her husband or hadn't banged someone before getting married and one of these warm beer pee buckets works. And I wish I was kidding, but the official Egyptian records say yeah, magic pee 
did this. His sight is back and he asks for the hand of the magic pea wielding woman so they can marry on the spot. All the while her husband awkwardly watches the consequences of his wife not cheating on him unfold. Oh, and then Pharaoh's burned his old wife to death. Or at least that's how the legend goes. I highly doubt that it really did restore his eyesight and maybe he just ordered historians to write a good story to explain a weird habit. You know, fetish, we got a fetish here. Sammy Number 10, Tutankhamun. This guy is arguably the most famous Egyptian pharaoh. So what is he doing at the top of the list? Well, King Tut wasn't famous for anything he really did in his lifetime. I mean, he was a young pharaoh, but someone on this list was technically pharaoh since he was two. No, he wasn't famous for anything he really did. Instead, Tutankhamun's tomb, discovered in 1922, was one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever. It was almost entirely intact, and his sarcophagus was incredible. Tutankhamun only lived to the age of 20, and how he lost the spark of life is actually still a mystery. He may not have done much other than a lot of religious reforms, but he managed to find another way of living forever. Number 9. Djoser so, with King Tut, he didn't really do much in his short lifetime. With Djoser, we actually don't really know a lot of what he did. Also like Tutankhamun, it was what he did for and after his departure from life that made him famous. Djoser was responsible for the construction of the Limestone Step Pyramid at Saqqara, the first of its kind. It was a huge architectural achievement. A building that stays structurally sound no matter how big it gets? Well, knock me down and call me Susan. The pyramid was actually completed after he lost the will to live by his official Imhotep. Number 8. Amenhotep III Okay, on to the members of the list who we know did something significant for Egypt during their time on the earth. Amenhotep III ruled an artistically and financially successful Egypt. He had pretty stellar reviews on Google for his trade relations which boosted up the economy of Egypt, but it was his artistic side that got him a bit more of a lasting recognition. He is the pharaoh with the most statues of himself. He created tons of monuments and a lot of stone scarabs that still hold up with tons of stories of historical events. I want some statues myself, is, is that weird? Probably. Number 7. Hot Shepsut now look, women in Egypt had high status and were respected more than in other parts of the world at the time. But a female pharaoh, while not unheard of, was unfortunately still pretty rare. Hatshepsut here was known as the most successful of those female pharaohs. Her father, King Thutmose I, wanted her to inherit the throne, and to that end, she was brought up learning how to lead. She reigned for 21 years after the death of her husband, and everything she did, from tons of construction projects to creating trade routes, went off without a single hitch. The people of Egypt lived in peace for her entire rule. Number 6. Thutmose III Thutmose III was, surprisingly, the son of Thutmose II, who was the husband of Hatshepsut. You know, number 7, the most successful female pharaoh. So that's the kind of cloth we're working with here. Thutmose was only two when his father bit the dust, so while he was technically the next pharaoh, his stepmother took over with him as co-ruler. This guy's contributions to the Egyptians were tremendous though. He was literally called the Napoleon of Egypt, which shouldn't Napoleon be the Thutmose III of France? Either way, Thutmose III, he helped expand Egypt like none before. He was a dope warrior and he helped in the construction of a lot of stuff. Most importantly, the Temple of Karnak. That's how you make Mama proud. Number 5. Xerxes I You've most likely heard of this guy. If not from his historically inaccurate portrayal in 300, then at least from one or two history classes. But Adam, wasn't he the Emperor of Persia? Yeah, well guess what my little bees? Egypt was part of the Persian Empire, which makes him pharaoh as well. This guy gets a pretty bad rap in history. But who wrote that history? The Greeks who despised him for his attempted invasion of Greece. Oh, I'm not saying he was great or anything. In fact, he had a bit of a disregard for the traditions of the Egyptians and their way of life. But you cannot tell me that he was not significant in history. Xerxes the Great makes this list for his infamy more than anything else. Number 4. Akhenaten So this is going to be the second not so beloved pharaoh on this list. 
But disdain for Akhenaten didn't come from war, or the fact that his massive army was defeated by a group of a couple hundred Greeks. No, Akhenaten here was infamous for his devout following of a singular god, Aten, the god of the sun. He actually moved the capital of Egypt to a new location that he titled Akhetaten, or Horizon of Aten. And he kind of made everyone else worship the single god Aten as well. He was famous for a different reason though. Akhenaten was married to Nefertiti. She played a huge part in his religious plans and she is well known in history for the limestone bust that was made of her and has been copied so many freaking times. Number 3. Khufu When you think of Egypt, there is likely one thing that pops straight into your mind. If you say anything other than the Great Pyramids of Giza, you do not pass go, you do not collect $200, and you lose. Khufu is the pharaoh you have to thank for this wonder of the ancient world. We still sort of don't know exactly how it was constructed, but this goliath limestone and mud brick structure was the tallest building in the world for like 4,000 years. It was built as the housing for his tomb and as his stairway to heaven. No, not the Led Zeppelin song. It has three chambers inside of it plus a gallery that we've discovered so far. As for what else Khufu contributed to ancient Egyptian life, we don't have much in the way of texts about that yet. But if this is the main thing, then I mean, I'd take it. Number 2. Cleopatra. How could she not be on this list? She was the very last pharaoh Egypt ever had, and she was arguably one of the most famous ones. Not only becoming a figure in history, but a character in literature, theater, and media. Cleopatra VII was pharaoh in Egypt from 51 to 30 BC, and it was one hell of a reign. She introduced tons of reforms to improve the Egyptian economy. She was an awesome diplomat and a scholar. She didn't have things too easy though. Having to fight her own brother for the throne and having to do some diplomacy with various famous Romans. Things kind of fizzled out near the end, but she certainly ended the line of Egyptian pharaohs with a beloved bang, as was her style. Number 1. Ramses II Alright, this one was definitely the one I thought of first. Ramses II is arguably the most famous of all the pharaohs. He reigned for 67 years. He had 96 children. He had a crazy successful military campaign conquering the Hittites, Syrians, and Nubians. No other pharaoh that we know of has been able to build like he has. He lived to the age of 90, which is insane for back then. And he professed himself a god, which I'm sure some people actually believed. Even today, when we moved his remains to France for restoration, he had to be given a passport that literally said, King, deceased, under the occupation. Truly an incredibly influential pharaoh. Kicking off the list at number 10, Ramses II. Ramses II, part two, you see what I'm doing here. He's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Ramses II is still considered the ruler of rulers. It's not a bad title, not bad at all. In year 30 of his reign, Ramses II was ritually transformed into an Egyptian god. Not bad, I'm turning 30 in a few years. I hope someone turns me into a god or gets me like a bike, <laughs> one of the two, I'll take both. So it was only fair that the spoiled pharaoh erected a bunch of statues of himself. Yeah, big selfies. Ramses put up more selfies than any other pharaoh in history. Most famous of them, the temples of Abu Simbel. There lies a monument dedicated to the late Queen Nefertiti and the Ramseum. We kicked off a part one with Ramses signing the first ever peace treaty, so, so for part two we had to show some of the glamour side of him, you know? Number nine, over 100 children. Who is this guy, Nick Cannon? Ramses II is the father to over 100 children. Uh, with that, of course, came the you know 200 wives, otherwise ow and how, if it was just one person. Ow and how, you know? <laughs> it's guesstimated that Ramses had 96 sons and 60 daughters. Of all those children, Ramses outlived a lot of them. It's almost like living as a king helped, perhaps, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you ate better. Maybe, just a hint. Just an idea. Eventually, Ramses was succeeded by his 13th son with his favorite queen, Queen Nefertari, giving her the fanciest tomb in the Valley of the Queens. Nefertari's tomb contains paintings that some consider are the greatest works of ancient Egyptian art. Not bad, I had like baseball wallpaper on mine growing up. Tomb QV66, he spoiled his lady, look at this. 
We gotta love him. Her tomb is 520 square meters covered in beautiful art, but in 1904, when Nefertari's tomb was rediscovered, all that was found was her mummified knees. Yeah, all that was left was her kneecaps. What, like, who does this? Raiders had stolen all the treasure prior, sometime in the many moons she had been lying there, and they even took her body and left her knees. Like, what? Monsters. They're like, yeah, grab the treasure, leave the patellas. Let's do it. Number eight, ready to strike. Pharaohs may have looked beautiful living in after death, but they meant business, okay? They were protective of their land, their family, their many, many lovers and children. The symbol often worn by pharaohs were symbols of power, a Nemes crown. This crown was a striped headcloth and the back of their head was covered with an aureus symbol aka an upside down cobra. The cobra symbol represents that the pharaoh is always ready and willing to attack their enemies. Attack them with venom. It's a pretty cool symbol. Mine just says DC Etnies shoes. I'm like, I don't, this says fight me if anything. DC skate shop in my back. I'm like, yeah, you can just attack me, that's cool. Number seven, King Teddy. The Pyramid of Teddy was built for the first ruler of the 6th dynasty. While it's not as flashy or massive as other pyramids, inside it contains the oldest writing ever, in the religious world that is. Inside it contains the pyramid texts, these legendary texts. They go all the way back to 2400 BC. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this king, King Teddy, could ascend to the heavens after his death. This isn't bizarre behavior by any means, but King Teddy, he was specific. He wanted to be a star like a literal star. There are spells and incantations that are in this tomb meant to free the king's soul as he arrives in the cosmos. More specifically for Teddy to become a star in the sky and join Osiris and Orion in the hashtag God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to these heavens. It's one thing to be buried with your gold, then you can live another life, but to become a star? I need to expand my dreams, my gosh. King Teddy was onto something here. When I go, in my will, I'm gonna be like, can I become a star, is that possible? Can I just throw me up into the heavens? Can I do that? Or bury me, that's cool. Bury me in Ajax, that works. <laughs> Number six, Yozer. For this one, we're looking into some bowl worshiping. So if you're a fan of bowls, here, this one's perfect for you, weirdly enough. Just north of the Step Pyramid of Pharaoh Dozier, archeologist August Mariette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium, it's a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, and it's a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. This was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls, these bulls that were said to be sacred, of course, and after their death, they would become immortal. Immortal bulls, that sounds badass and also terrifying, that's very scary. Don't wear red around these guys. Today at Saqqara, there's a massive vault, it's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock, it's huge, and along the sides, there's 24 chambers, each with a sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Just impossible craftsmanship all around, especially at these times, like, oh my god, my wrists are tired just typing about this, let alone doing this. Inside these boxes were animal remains, bones and all that jazz, but back in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. You had to mummify them, right? Hence part one and where we are now. How are these tombs built so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and also, where do these bones come from? I have so many questions. Maybe on part three we'll answer them. Number five, we love cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still go for it. I still pet them. I risk everything just to... Yes, I don't care. I ruined my entire weekend just to get my face all up in their whiskers. Nobody did it like ancient Egyptians. You've probably heard this at one point or another. They worshipped cats. They were like, you know, the legendary <laughs> cats. That was, that was their thing. I'm more of a golden retriever guy, but I get it. They're cute. They respected them. They worshipped them. Even though at the time, dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. It's because they just stare at shit randomly. Mid-conversation, a cat would just be like... No, they're not magical, they're terrifying. They're on something. If you had a cat, you had good luck, apparently. A friend of mine has two fat cats. He has some pretty good luck, I think. If they're fat, they're good, hmm. When a cat passed away back in ancient Egyptian times, they too were mummified. You would think that alone was just plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs, they would obviously go a step further. Hence this fun list. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and would mourn them until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. That's, I, I got over my childhood animal in like six business days. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's a long time, you know? Next time your friend tells you their cat passed away, tell them if they really love them, they would shave their eyebrows. Test them. Number four, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, well, 
all the pharaohs were considered kings, but it was equal at the time. And they all look athletic. They all look like these warriors, right? They look to be in great shape. When in reality, a lot of these pharaohs were probably pretty overweight or unhealthy. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day, plus a little dab of honey every eight minutes, you're gonna gain some weight. Yeah, that's how it goes. Many of these ancient pharaohs did have diabetes, and Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong and all that jazz, but almost all historians agree that she was out of shape and quite unhealthy. Honestly, fair, I would do the exact same thing. She was ahead of her time. If somebody was like, hey, I'm gonna make a statue for you, what should I make it look like? I'm like, no, yeah, give him an eight pack, make him jacked, I don't know. Make him look like Michael Jordan, I don't know. Number three, gender reveal parties. Okay, we've seen all these videos online. A guy goes to swing and hit a baseball, he misses, it hits the ground. There's a big pink cloud of smoke, everyone's like, oh my God. Gender reveal parties, right? They're pretty popular. Turns out they're popular back in ancient Egyptian days, but nobody did it like them. Also, nobody started any wildfires back then when any uh, ancient Egyptians did it, so that's nice. We should go take a note from them. Back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. You would have to use wheat and barley seeds. You would have to pee on them. And then, however it grew, that would determine the sex. I would feel bad. First of all, I'd be like, hi, we're curious. Don't mind us. I'm just gonna pee on your crops, sir. Let us know how it grows. We're really aiming towards a boy this time. We have 96 girls, so we're gonna try a couple of boys. Yeah, depending on how the crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. And it worked a lot of the time. It's pretty wild. We went from watering crops to burning them down just to find out a gender. Hashtag it's a boy. Number two, more tattoos. More tattoos for number two. We love it. You guys saw what I did. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. We talked about that, the whole cat stuff and the whole hippo situation in part one, that was violent. But what about baboons? Did they get any love? Baboons, I say it weird, baboons, baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. One of the most strange things pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Yep, stop resisting, you're going to jail. Me and seven baboons, let's carry them into the car, bam. Imagine stealing food for your family just to like try and get by and four baboons pop out, start doing parkour and then arrest you in front of everyone. That'd be so embarrassing and also alarming. They trained baboons to pick fruit, make beer and even entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party apparently. If their dance moves alone would be reason enough to get a tattoo of one of my arms, honestly. Going all crazy, throwing their own at people, I'd be like, yeah, right here or here, I don't care. And finally, number one, the afterlife. One of the most fascinating parts about these ancient Egyptian pharaohs is that they would pass away literally covered in gold, head to toe. It's nice to know that this long ago, some of these kings and queens still rest untouched by grave robbers or explorers. The afterlife for these pharaohs was important. And as soon as they take on the throne, work is immediately underway on their tomb. That's a little grim when you think about it. It's like, hey, congratulations. We're gonna start making where you're gonna be buried. It's like. Thanks, I think. These monuments took time, but they were built to last, and clearly, they have. Pharaoh's eyes were painted black with coal. They did this so that they would look like the god Horus after they passed on. Starting off our list at number 10, the first peace treaty. Unusual at the time, absolutely. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271, BC. At this point in history, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was finally underway. Tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. What's left to do now at this point? Ramses II and King Hattusili III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found right now in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official. Our man Guinness confirms it. Boom, that's how you know. Moving on. Number nine, game night. I love board games, and honestly, that includes Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then, you know? Pass and go, I'm like, okay, I'll pay the tax. I'm respecting this game so far. But ancient Egyptians, turns out they also loved board games. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen, Senate, and 20 Squares. Those are some popular games. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC, and the goal here was to reach the center of the spiral. The board was a coiled snake almost. Senate was the most popular game. Kings and queens alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Of course, the rules are still unknown, heavily debated, just like Monopoly today. I'm like, is it 200 or 100? Are we sure? 
But now we have some ideas how Egyptians played Senate. There were three rows of ten squares, the last five were always decorated. Now it's assumed this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus King Tut was buried with one of these boards, so that's definitely something to do with it. And there's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so you know it was addictive. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. My palms are already so sweaty. Number eight, glamour. Makeup in ancient Egyptian culture was key. Not only did they wear makeup and smell good because they wanted to resemble the very gods they believed in, but makeup had a practical use as well in the daily life of a pharaoh. They believed makeup gave you protection from the gods Ra and Horus. They would put together these beauty kits by grinding down malachite and galena, and then they would create the substance called coal. There wasn't a lot of blending back then. Makeup was often applied directly to the skin using wood or bone. And it wasn't just the ladies as well. Men wore makeup and perfume. Of course, you gotta look good and smell good. Billy, have you seen them? What? I, I wanna wear some of this. They smell like beautifulness. They smell like the afterlife. They smell amazing. Egyptians believed makeup had healing abilities, and honestly, they weren't wrong. Makeup back then had enough lead in them, so eye infections would stay away, ideally. Number seven, Cleopatra's methods. Male rulers took the name Ptolemy and queens were Cleopatra. Her lineage runs deep in the heart of Egypt, but Cleopatra, fun fact, she was not actually Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BCE, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this new wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted centuries. As Cleopatra got older, she was determined to learn Egyptian. And due to political structure, she started to style herself as the goddess Isis. And then in comes Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar had a history of his own, obviously, and his, rather than family and power, was filled more with, you know, lust, more than anything. He was known to sleep around and then use their power after doing the dirty. When these two crossed paths, history was never the same. In October of 50 BCE, Cleopatra had fled to Syria. Once there, she established an army and returned two years later to face her brother. Cleopatra knew that during this time, she needed all the support she could get, specifically now from the Romans. At the same time, Caesar was looking to collect debts from Cleopatra's father, so they both relied on each other in some way. It was a match made in heaven. Your most compatible has been updated. Right swipe. I would right swipe on Alexander the Great, for sure. I'd be like, who's this handsome man? Mm. Nicknamed Bald Adulterer. Okay, you know, he's trouble. Number six, King Tut. One of the greatest mysteries is, of course, the history of the young King Tut. The young boy became pharaoh at just age nine in 1332 BC, but during his time of ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh died at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was seen again. Howard Carter discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful here in history. Sure, it's exciting finding mummies and discovering your history and all that jazz, but when King Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin. But in doing so, they damaged him. So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age. We have some ideas though, it's not entirely hopeless. It's believed right now that King Tut had a broken leg. After some 3D scans were done, it appears the king wasn't in the best shape prior. He may have fallen off of a chariot. So if Tut passed away at an early age, out of nowhere, this could mean another mystery is afoot. Number five, Queen Nefertiti's resting place. So yes, on one hand, 3D scanning technology is vital when it comes to these ancient sites. We're able to figure out King Tut's medical issues from thousands of years ago. It's impressive, it's great. But thanks to this new technology, we're also finding hidden chambers in these tombs as well. Another theory surrounding the queen, the lost queen, Nefertiti, is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this at all. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. But King Tut passed away at age 19, so many believe that his own burial chamber at that point wasn't even built yet. So instead, they had to use hers, they had to improvise. A radar survey conducted around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us a possible hidden chamber, right behind the north wall of the burial chamber. We still haven't found her final resting place, but perhaps this recent 2021 discovery of an ancient city will hold us off until then. Look at this, we missed this on the news. Where was all this? Crazy. Number four, a fake beard. Not really unusual considering the times, but this is definitely worth a mention. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, and there were only just a few that were women in total. But during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. 
This was her goal, this was her vision. The pharaoh fake beard, massive muscles, historians believe this was done as an act of politics. It was done on purpose to make a point. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson then took the throne, Thutmose III. And then he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Number three, no more religion. This was a huge deal in ancient Egypt, rightfully so. The pharaoh Akhenaten thought it would be a great idea to just end multiple religious beliefs. Yep, just uh, stop. Okay, now we just do the one. Traditional Egyptian culture would believe in multiple gods, but this pharaoh couldn't keep up, so he convinced everybody to believe in just one god, Aten. Well, only days after his passing, the people of Egypt said, screw that, we're gonna go back to multiple beliefs. That was working a lot better for us, thank you, sir. And then also, we're destroying every piece of evidence that involves you for trying that nonsense. Yeah, temples, cooking pots, anything with his image, gone and ideally forgotten. It wasn't until the 19th century when we realized this pharaoh once ruled. Number two, hippo problems. Do you have any idea how fast hippos are in real life? I had no clue my entire life. They're really fast, they fly at you, they're like dinosaurs. Hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Yeah, I'll just lead with that. Pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh ever, so it felt fitting to include some pet problems in our list. We don't know much about the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, that's where we're talking. But what we do know for certain is that King Menes ruled over Egypt during a peaceful time, and he was stomped to death by a hippo. It's literally how his history.com says it, in that order. This king spent over 60 years on the throne, and a hippo got him. I don't think there's a harder way to go out, honestly, in my opinion. It's a mystery still, thousands of years later, but look at zoos today. I don't know, maybe a hippo didn't like living like a king. Maybe he wanted to live like Shrek and just splash around and be dirty. He's an animal, he's literally a hippo, you know? And finally, coming in at number one, a renewed passport. I'll be honest, right now, I currently have no idea where my passport is. Chris, do you know where yours is? Yeah. Wow, we have an adult here. Wow, an adult, that's lovely. I always panic and search for it 13 hours before a flight. I am the worst to travel with. Passports are important, obviously, and they're a pain in the ass to replace. But did you know you can still get one even if you've been dead for, I don't know, thousands of years? There's a fun fact. Pharaoh Ramses II, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers, got a passport back in 1974. Yeah, you heard me. After being exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided it's time to send the lost king off to Paris to get, you know, a little touched up, being dead that long and all. Now, obviously, you're not gonna list this pharaoh as luggage, that's so rude. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute. On the passport, he had his age, his occupation, king, obviously, and in case it wasn't clear, it was stated that the king too was deceased. Anyone who's seen The Mummy can obviously, you know, relax at that point. Kicking off the list at number 10, got a passport. Ramses II is known as one of the greatest ancient Egyptian rulers of all time. He was called Ramses the Great, so that's a good sign already. At a young age, he fought in harsh battles to protect the borders of Egypt, and during his reign, the Egyptian army reached 100,000 men. That's a pretty large army. He was later referred to as the Great Ancestor, and it didn't take long for Ramses II to declare himself a god. It's always fun being like, hey, by the way, I'm a god now. That's how cool I am. 30 years into his ruling, Ramses was ritually turned into an Egyptian god. It was a formal thing. Though it wasn't until 3,000 years later until Ramses would truly soar through the skies. He was buried in his treasure after 96 years of living, and in 1974, he finally started to show signs of aging. Not too bad. He went from being on display to being sent to Paris to get a glow up, you know, to preserve the king's body even longer. Instead of being listed as luggage on the way to Paris, the pharaoh was given an official Egyptian passport for the commute. The government gave a mummy a passport. This is like the first five minutes of a horror film. Under occupation, it even said king. And there was even a small disclaimer noting that he was in fact still dead. You can never be too sure, you know? Number nine, baboon tattoos. Ancient Egyptians worshiped animals. This is common knowledge now at this point. We've heard about their love towards cats, which I'll explain later on, but what about baboons? Yeah, they were pretty important pieces to this ancient puzzle as well. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. Now, one of the most strange things that pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Imagine stealing a pair for your family and then four baboons start doing parkour, chasing you down. That's so alarming. I would just throw it and be like, please stop, you're so scary and strong. They train baboons to pick fruit, they train them to make beer, and they also train them to entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to tattoo one on my arms. You know what? I get it. 
get a Harambe tattoo. I'm like, you know, I, it's, I, I see it. I see the similarities. Number eight, worship dung beetles. So worshiping a baboon that dances and makes holiday ales, yeah, I can see how one would worship such a creature. That makes sense. But pharaohs also worship dung beetles and their reasoning may surprise you. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way naturally. Animals are born with natural instincts. Sea turtles race to the sea. These guys follow the cosmos. It's pretty wild. It's one thing to follow the sun naturally because it gives off warmth. Sunflowers will literally turn their head to find the sun, which is super creepy, but it's beautiful. These insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their poop towards it. They'd be like, hello Milky Way, and they just... Hieroglyphs of these beetles are seen all over. Like near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, for example, there's a massive scarab monument. And today, if you walk around it nine times, you get good luck. And don't worry, you don't have to roll any droppings at the same time. Don't get dizzy, that's all, it's the only rule. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which ancient Egyptians believed was the sun. I grew up thinking the sun was a baby, but that's because I watched Teletubbies, so, you know, it depends. Number seven, surprise each other. Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were a pretty beneficial couple, to say the least. Cleopatra would use Caesar's armies, which in turn would allow her to rule Egypt, while Caesar was eyeing down Cleopatra's extreme wealth. They were the perfect pair. She was able to financially support Caesar enough for him to return to power back in Rome. But how did such a perfect pair meet in the first place? Did Cleopatra swipe right? Hmm, no. Well, a then 52-year-old Julius Caesar visited the much younger Cleopatra, so she then sent a surprise gift to his chambers. She got her crew to roll her up in a carpet or bed sheets, it's not really confirmed, something along those lines, and then delivered her to his door, completely nude. He unraveled a naked Cleopatra, and he's like, okay, hello. That's pretty impressive. Cleopatra was down for fun surprises. While we don't recommend this as an approach ever, it's one worth mentioning on our list. Number six, gender reveal parties. We've all seen those videos. A guy goes to hit a baseball, he misses it. The baseball breaks and there's pink dust all around his feet and he starts crying. It's wonderful. Gender reveal parties were quite popular, you know, until they started lighting wildfires. But back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. Instead of peeing on a pregnancy test, you would have to use wheat and barley seeds instead. Depending on how those barley crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. They were right 85% of the time, which is quite impressive back in the day. We went from watering crops to burning them. Hashtag, it's a boy. Number five, space knife. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with the king. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon to be buried with your treasure or belongings. It's why ancient Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so grave robbers can't just sneak in after you pass away and then take all of your goodies. So two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other with gold. Now, with iron being more rare than gold during the Bronze Age, this was quite a big deal. With recent advancements in technology, we're able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescent spectrometry, and according to the journal Meteorites and Planetary Science, the blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that its material is that of extraterrestrial origin. A blade fell from the sky, and now a king has it. That's pretty insane. Also, aliens? Just saying. Number four, KB-55. Also located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB-55, was found by Edward Arton back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason that we call this tomb by a number rather than a name is because we really don't know for sure who's inside. Even the walls of the tombs inside, they aren't covered with beautiful hieroglyphs to tip us off on their history or their ruling, it's just bare. The only hint as to who is buried remains on the walls. It's one hieroglyph that remains, and it was discovered also in 1907, and it translates simply to, the evil one shall not live again. That's very scary. That's Definitely scarier than Greg was here. I don't know. Even massive stones were built and set up in order to prevent anything from getting out. Whereas usually with ancient tombs, it's the opposite. So that's pretty scary. The description for those inside the tomb has also been destroyed. So we have really no idea who's in KB 55 or what. <laughs> Number three, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens and they look athletic. They look to be in great shape, when in reality, these pharaohs were probably quite obese. 
I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day and you have baboons dancing around, plus a little dab of honey every, I don't know, eight minutes, yeah, you're gonna gain some weight. Many of these ancient pharaohs had diabetes. And Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong, but historians all agree that she was out of shape and extremely unhealthy. Honestly, I would do the exact same if I was there back then. She was ahead of her time. If somebody made a statue for me, I'd be like, yeah, give it an eight pack, make him extremely jacked and seven two. Can we do that? Sure, no one's gonna ask questions. I'm Dwayne The Rock Johnston, just write it down, please. Number two, worship cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still love them. I still pet them. I ruined my entire night just to get my face right there next to their cute little furry face. But ancient Egyptians, like I said earlier, really loved cats. They respected them, they worshiped them. Even though at the time dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. So if there's ever a cat versus dog argument going on on your end of the screen, cats win. I'm allergic and I'm still saying cats win. That's, that's huge. If you had a cat, it means you had good luck. When cats passed away, they too were mummified back in the day. You would think that alone was plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs went a step further. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and then mourn until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. Next time your friend tells you that their cat passed away, tell them that if they really love them, they'll shave their eyebrows off and then see what they say. Also, you don't have to make your friends shave their eyebrows. Let's leave this one in the past. That's fine. Just be sad with eyebrows. Be like, hmm. Number one, fight a hippo. Egypt's first pharaoh, Menes, although we know next to nothing about his history, there is something there that has historians scratching their heads to this day. At his early time, the pharaoh was setting out to unite all of Egypt under his rule. The time that he ruled as well is considered a rather peaceful time when comparing it to years later. We know that he was well respected, and we also know that after his 63 years of peaceful ruling, he was stomped to death by a hippo. That's horrible, it's a horrible way to go out. He was an elderly ruler at that time. He was surrounded by guards and somehow a hippo got all the way to his chambers. A hippo, and then ended the pharaoh's life. Some suggest that the reason there's nothing written about this pharaoh's tragic, horrible demise is because it's possible that the hippo was his pet. This is why you don't try and tame a beast as a pet. Perhaps this was an early similar situation as the Siegfried and Roy tiger attack. Just stick to smaller magical cats. They're much safer, they won't stomp you to death. Oh my god, it's horrible. Number 10, overshadowed and the beard. Hatshepsut for a long while was content to play the supporting role among Egypt's royals. But when she decided she wasn't anymore, things took a turn. She was the daughter of Thutmose I and wife slash sister to her half-brother Thutmose II. I know, don't worry, I'll address it later in the video, stay tuned. When he died in 1479 BC and left their son as heir, she took on the role as regent to Thutmose III. But she basically just acted as the rightful ruler. As the young king came of age finally, she declared herself pharaoh. The strangest part was that she chose to portray herself in pictures as a man with a male body and a false beard. She said that the god Amun was her father and insisted that he commanded her to take charge of Egypt. Who's gonna argue with a god, right? But no one could quite explain the issue with the beard. Nevertheless, during her reign, it was a time of peace and prosperity for Egypt. Number 9, Sesostris. Sesostris was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, who was celebrated for the extent of his conquests. He stretched the kingdom further than anyone before him, but he was not without his quirks. According to accounts by Herodotus, Sesostris left pillars on every battlefield. Along with the usual bragging and boasting of how he won, he would carve into them images of genitalia, like people do on the bathroom stalls, you know? If he thought that his enemy fought valiantly, he carved a If he thought they didn't put much of a fight, he would carve a Great. Yeah, that just goes to show what he thought about things, huh? The latter was a sign of disrespect for his subdued enemies, while the other was a sign of honor, like, hey man, you stuck it to me. Apparently, some even stood the test of time, lasting over 1,500 years, and seen firsthand by Herodotus himself. For those of you who don't know, for reference, Herodotus is considered as the father of historians, one of the very first to take up the task. Number eight, ceremonial seating. The whole idea behind the pharaohs was that they were direct descendants from the gods themselves. Therefore, they too had deific powers and had the capability of restoring life to the land. The Nile River had significant importance to the people of 
Egypt. It provided fertile soil and water irrigation. It was pretty awesome. In order to ensure its abundance would continue, pharaohs would organize a festival where they would ceremoniously fill it with their seed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Some historians believe that this was in honor of the creation story of how life came to be and therefore it was kind of like a fertility festival. Crowds would gather at the Nile and await the arrival of their pharaoh. They would then disrobe and give their pleasure into the river to ensure its bounty. Some historians say it was just the pharaoh who did this while others say that the men joined in after. Evidence still remains pretty slim as to whether this really did happen so take this one with a grain of salt but that's not to say that there isn't any evidence at all that it did happen. So there. Number 7. Deliver Me Naked Cleopatra is known as one of the most beautiful women in history, but this could be due to how she used her feminine wiles to get what she wanted. Her beauty and cunning became renowned as a result. While other queens like the one I mentioned before concealed their beauty, Cleopatra was all about showing it off cuz girl if you got it flaunt it in order to help secure the political ally and power connected to Caesar Cleopatra knew how to make an entrance and knew how to win over a guy it's, it's pretty easy he was around 52 when they met and the egyptian queen was just like 20 and in her prime so she looked great. She smuggled herself into Alexandria where Caesar was staying, had her servant tie her up in a bed sack naked and carried indoors to Caesar and she was like have at her buddy. In other words, she wrapped her naked body in a carpet, made Caesar's jaw drop to the floor and secured one of the most beneficial unions on the spot. Honestly, not really messed up. Kind of badass. Honestly, just do your thing. Work it girl. I dream of having that confidence with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Go girl, you got this. You get that empire. Number six, Cats and the Battle. Ancient Egypt would have welcomed the film the adaptation of Cats, unlike the rest of the world, with open arms and probably would have built a shrine to it. Giant human cats eating human cockroaches would be revered. Bottom line, cats in ancient Egypt were worshipped and treated like family. It was considered a crime punishable by death to harm one due to the belief in the goddess Bastet. One pharaoh even risked losing a battle because of cats themselves. The Battle of Pelusium of 525 BCE between Pharaoh Samic III and the Persian king Cambyses II resulted in the first Persian conquest of Egypt all because of cats. Cambyses took advantage of the cat loving side of Egypt and used hostages of cats and animals as leverage. So they were just kind of like, well we can't, we can't fight if the cats are let loose. What are we going to do? We can't kill the cats. And that's that's uh, how they lost that battle. Number five, honey coated. Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? Unless they're a bumblebee, because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well, guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well, you know the phrase you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day. Poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. Number four. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone. The tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays. I get you. The economy was deteriorating. Weather was devastating food production. Things were corrupt as hell. And on top of all this, his secondary wife, T.A., hated his guts. She, along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal chief. Chamberlain hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number three, till death do us part. Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well, 
If you were servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife. So when you died, you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the Pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two, Mary Marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? Promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered a very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining ma even marrying any of my cousins. That's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. Hey. That's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half-sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar and that whole thing we talked about. Yeah, that thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title of heretic king and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disk. Sometime around his fourth year he started sending out agents to erase names and Images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel el Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. At least now, we can see why. Starting off with a classic, the Corbury Corhari curse. One of the German branches of Queen Victoria's family were the Coburgs, who were famously cursed with more than hemophilia. Hungarian noble Antoinette de Corhari married into the family in 1815, and the bride's father persuaded the emperor to sign Antoinette the legal status of a man, allowing her to inherit his estates and whole fortune that wouldn't have gone to anyone in the male line. A monk named Brother Amerskius was one of the super distant male relatives outraged at losing potential inheritance. So the brat cursed her. The hardest hit was the royal house of Portugal and the Coheri branch of the Saxon Coburg family. Her son Ferdinand's wife dies in labor. Then Maria's successor Pedro lost his wife as well. Pedro then passes away and a week before one of his brothers had died, then a week after Ferdinand, his other brother dies. Within eight years, five members of this family are dead. Even Pedro's successor is plagued with misfortune, as are his children and Pedro's children. This whole family is killed in coups and inside jobs and tragic illness right up to Prince Leopold in 1916 who pushes his lover to the edge causing both of their deaths. The talk of the tabloids, Grimaldi witch curse. There are a couple different versions of the reason for the curse. Prince Rainier the first abducted a Flemish woman who escaped or she was a witch being burned at the stake by him. Whoever it was they got revenge with the curse. Never will a Grimaldi find happiness in marriage. Prince Rainier the third's father was gay and ended an unhappy marriage after 10 years to announce it. And while Grace Kelly and the prince were sold to the public as a great love story, the truth was he cheated on her a whole bunch before she passed in the 1982 car crash. Her daughter Stephanie, who survived the incident, endured several failed relationships, and Grace's other daughter Caroline had a tumultuous love life. With a divorce, her second husband who died in a speedboat accident, and her third husband a prince, she now divorced. Perhaps taking the curse seriously, the current reigning prince, Albert III, put off marriage for a long time, instead having a bunch of illegitimate children with various women before marrying Charlene Whitstock in 2011. It was super bumpy seeing as she found out about some love children, called it off, and 
many persuaded her not to. She could be seen crying throughout all of her wedding footage. It followed through the lineage until it started a war. Carolai's curse. May heaven and hell blast your happiness. May your family be exterminated. May you be smitten in the person of those you love best. May your children be brought to ruin and your life wrecked. And yet may you live on lonely, unbroken, horrible grief to tremble when you recall the name of Carolai. Yikes. That's the curse placed on the Habsburgs after Carolai's son was executed for being part of the Hungarian uprising. In 1853, Habsburg Emperor had to dodge attempts on his life, but he found love with Bavarian Princess Elizabeth. They lose one daughter to illness before Elizabeth herself passes after birthing their son. Archduke Maximilian, heir to throne, is sent over to rule Mexico, where he's beheaded by Mexicans and his wife sent to an asylum. The hopes of the emperor now became centered on the crown prince, who married Belgian princess Stephanie despite being in love with Baroness Marie Vesteria. They're notoriously found dead in a hunting lodge in 1889, and it's ruled they've taken their own lives with no investigation ever done. The case is still known in Austria as the Mayerling Mystery. I could keep going through generations of this curse, but I'll say it hits its crescendo with, with the killing of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and we all know what happens and what started that. Next up, the prophecy as promised. Amamalama placed a curse on the Raja Wadiar of the Mysore Kingdom in the early 15th century when he came to take her husband's throne. She had fled, taking her jewels to the nearby town of Talakadu, and when the officials came to apprehend her, she spoke a three-part curse before jumping into the Kaveri River to end her own life. The curse commanded Talakadu become a barren expanse of sand, and for the Malagangi, to a village nearby the river, to turn into an unfathomable whirlpool. And she condemned the kings of Wayadar's family to not have any children for eternity. While the events don't play out exactly as she demanded, they came eerily close. Talakadu became a desert-like place. The river near Malangi commonly sees whirlpools, and the Wadiar family has only birthed male children in an alternative generation, which makes it difficult for kings to have direct heirs. Historian Dr. A. Verarapa explains that if we take a scientific view, there's no scope for a curse. But if you observe the Woodyar family tree, six rulers since the 17th century have been adopted sons or nephews. The Woodyars have to acknowledge this fact. But has the curse finally been broken? In 2017, India TV reports the current ruler, himself one of these adopted sons, and his wife welcomed the first Woodyar baby in 54 years. It's one we all know and we can probably sing. Ra Ra Rasputin warned them. The Romanovs were the last royal family ruling of the Russian Empire and they had ruled the country for 400 years. Obviously by the 20th century it's about time for some change and the Romanov dynasty was facing some serious challenges. I mean we got World War One raging, famine and war stoked aggression groups, and the Romanov's only son Alexei was the sole heir and had hemophilia, which was a huge issue then. But Rasputin was able to keep the boy from dying on five separate occasions. Needless to say from the perspective of the Romanovs, Rasputin was the only thing keeping the dynasty and empire alive single handedly. Rasputin however issued a prophecy early in his life before he even met the Romanovs. A vision that if someone killed him their entire family would die with him at the hands of the Russian people. He made sure to be a broken record about this too. Well, His warning failed to discourage Felix Yusupov who poisoned, jabbed, pew pewed and strangled then drowned Raspi. And Felix was the cousin of the Tsar Nicholas of Romanov dynasty. Just like that Rasputin's death was the end of the Romanovs as just a few months later the Russian Revolution swept the monarchy out of power executing all of them and making Rasputin's prophecy come true. A lesson in theft, the strawberry tiara. Why theft? Because a lot of these stolen jewels are the cursed ones and it's not clear where the curse of the Hesse Darmenstadt comes from but the court jeweler points to the strawberry tiara as the culprit. The tiara was designed by Prince Albert, husband of Britain's Queen Victoria, for their daughter Princess Alice to wear on her wedding day. But before he could see her walk down the aisle in it, Albert died of typhoid fever at 42. Alice wore the tiara at her wedding and brought it to Hess, where exactly 17 years later to the day of her father dying of the disease, Alice died of typhoid. But not before watching one of her daughters suffer and die of it as well. Alice, like Victoria, carried the gene for hemophilia and through her daughters, Alice passed it on to the Spanish and royal families with tragic results. Perhaps none of that was down to a curse on the strawberry tiara, but then in 1937, five members of the Hess Ducal family were flying in a relative's wedding when the plane crashed while they were trying to make an emergency landing. Everyone on board was killed, and the strawberry tiara was recovered from the wreckage 
in one piece. This time, a curse waits 10 generations. Nepal had become a sovereign nation in the 1700s, ruled by Prithvi Narayan Shah. And there are two stories for how this he became cursed. Both begin with him coming across a supposed hermit. Either what the hermit offers the king food, which he refuses, or the king offers the hermit a bowl of curd, which he eats, and then tries to exorcise vomit on the king, who obviously moves out of the line of fire. Either way, the hermit is actually revealed to be the god Goraknath, and he was pissed. So, King Shah is told his line would fall after 10 generations. Horrifically, on June 1st, 2001, the then King Nepal Biryandra Bir Birkram Shahdev and most of his family were together in their palace. For reasons that are still not clear, the Prince Dipendra, the king's son and heir, entered the room loaded with weapons and killed nine people, including his father, mother, brother, and sister. Dipendra then tried to take his own life and ended up in a coma for two days, during which, because of how monarchies work, he was officially Nepal's king by default. Dipendra then dies and the crown is passed to Berenda's brother before Nepal ended its monarchy in 2008. It lasted exactly 10 generations. How a curse of twins led to Zulu defeat, maybe. The Zulu people had a belief that twins were cursed, and Makavi and her sister, Mamana, were allowed to live because their father, King Jama, who loved his precious daughters too much, he just couldn't fulfill that obligation. His subjects were not impressed and proceeded to blame everything bad that happened to the Zulu on the curse the sisters carried by being alive. They even blamed them when their own mother died, which was bad news for the clan, seeing as she hadn't provided a male heir before her soul's departure. Makabe continued to buck tradition. When her father died, she became regent for the young half-brother that she had, even though no woman had ever held that position before. The Zulu called her a bloodthirsty despot, but she did step down voluntarily when her brother was old enough. 20 years later, his son, Shaka Zulu, Mayabaki's nephew, would ascend to the throne. Shaka was both a very successful king and a very, very, very violent person. He had a thing for killing his own people by the thousands for no reason. So, Mugabe, she arranged for his brothers to kill him. As he died, legend said he cursed the Zulu. You will never rule this land. It will be ruled by the sparrows who will fly across the sea and build their nests high on the cliffs. It said this curse brought the oppressive white invaders that overthrew the next king. And the curse of Mugabe led to the curse of Shaka, which led to the defeat of the Zulu. If she'd shown mercy, perhaps she'd be spared. Death of three. Just as you have fired, in the same way, one day you too will be killed, said Swami Kapatri on the 7th of November, 1966. Since 1965, millions of saints in India had be started a huge movement to enact laws on cow killings and cow protection. Indra Gandhi promised to do this as a prime minister and received blessings from the Hindu saint Kapatri. She never did though. So on November 7th of 1966, Gopash Tami, the most sacred day for worshipping a cow as per Hindu calendar, a huge crowd of Hindu saints and Garashkas staged a peace protest in front of parliament to demand a ban on cow slaughter and were attacked by the police force, resulting in the death of 5,000 plus Hindus. Indra Gandhi's government deployed an estimated 5,000 buses and trucks to remove any eyewitnesses, refusing to shoulder any responsibility for the attack and blaming it on the home minister. This is when Karpatri, devastated, curses her to die the same way she let the Hindus die that day. True to his word, Indra Gandhi is killed by her own bodyguards the exact same way. And now, I hope you are ready for some curses on curses on curses. Pelops, he's going to marry the princess. He offers a servant a night with her if he helps kill the king. Naturally, it's a total double cross and once the king is dead, the servant is ordered to be executed by Pelops. So, this basic ass servant curses Pelops' entire family and even backdates the curse to splinter reality. Tantalus questions the Olympics god's powers and kills his son, King Pelops, and feeds him to the gods while saying it's ox. The gods go, uh, no it's not. And then he's the one cursed to stand in a puddle and he can't drink it and then he's under the fruit he can't eat forever in the underworld, thus the word tantalized. Third generation, Pelops had two sons, Atreus and Thyestus, who then kill their half bro so they don't gotta share the kingdom with them. Thyestus starts sneaking off with Atreus' wife, so Atreus cooks his sons and feeds them to, Theus, to Thyestus. What is with this family doing that? Atreus himself fathered two sons before he was killed, named Agamemnon and Menelaus. They married Clytemesta and Helen, who gets kidnapped and causes the Troy War. On the way there, Agames talks crap about Athena, who stops the wind and strands them at sea. Only answer, Agames has to sacrifice his daughter. He does so to the horror of his wife, and the wind returns and takes them to Troy where they win the war. Oracle concubine Cassandra, cursed by Apollo for not wanting to bang him, foretells his wife Clyte will smoke Agam for this, which she 100% does. Then Cassandra dies too, as foretold. Agam's son, Orestes, comes home to his sister Electra, now the sixth generation of the curse. Persuaded to avenge their father, he commits 
commits the horrible Greek crime of matricide and is so shunned by everyone, he starts being tormented by fury demons. Within the day of her mother's death, she learns her betrothed took his life, so Electra does the same. Orestes is now completely alone, praying to Apollo, the god suggests, hey, take it to Athena for intervention. They put on the first trial in history in Athens. The jury voted. Five voted guilty, five voted innocent. Athena broke the tie in Orestes' favor, and with that result, it seems the curse is now done. Orestes returns home to his kingdom to take his father's throne. However, he never marries and has no living family, so the curse of the house of Atreus ended with him, even if Athena hadn't sided with him. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Kensington system. Queen Victoria's reign began in 1837, and it lasted up until her death in 1901. She was just 18 years old when she found herself on the throne, and it was all by chance, as she was actually fifth in line when she was born. This is all stressful enough, but certainly one of the worst parts of her upbringing was being brought up under the Kensington system. This basically all started when her mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, created this system in order to control her daughter, literally just isolated her away from all of her friends and even from other family members, and apparently this was done to keep her quote unquote pure. The Duchess would monitor her every move, she would decide who she could see and who she could speak to, and Victoria only had two friends she could play with growing up, one being her half-sister and the other being her mother's attendant, Sir John Conroy. Victoria was even forced to share a room with her mother until she was queen. She couldn't even walk down the hall by herself. In the end, Victoria placed a lot of blame on John Conroy for manipulating her mother. She even called him the demon incarnate. In our number 9 spot today, we have the royal affairs. There have been many, many rumors over the years about the royal family and their extramarital affairs. Okay, I'm not saying it's a tradition, but it happens a lot, and I'm saying this goes way back. So far back that one of the first accusations of this within the royal family dates all the way back to Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. Since then, it has only continued with people such as Princess Margaret and Peter Townsend, Princess Anne and Commander Timothy Lawrence, and of course, King Charles and Queen Consort Camilla just to name a few. The latter of those definitely being the most famous, especially when the now king was confronted about it by his wife at the time, the beloved Princess Diana. Apparently, King Charles responded to the confrontation by saying, quote, well, I refuse to be the only Prince of Wales who never had a mistress. Maybe not the attitude to keep when you're speaking to your wife, who you're cheating on. I don't know. I guess I'm just not royal enough to get it. In our number 8 spot today, we have pets. As we all know very well, image is everything for the royal family, and that is down to the finest, smallest detail, including pets. It is well known that the queen absolutely loved corgis, and how could we possibly blame her? Apparently, however, if a dog is not a corgi or a Labrador, it is socially looked down upon. Can't describe how insane that is. They're dogs! If you brought a dog who had just been rolling around in the mud everywhere with you, I could see why that wouldn't be as widely accepted among fancy social circles, but only giving the choice of a few random breeds seems kind of ridiculous. Apparently, Meghan Markle actually had to give up her beagle named Guy a few years ago before she joined the family, and then left. Left it. I guess she can probably have whatever dog she wants now, so there's always an upside. In our number 7 spot today, we have King Charles I. Okay, this is one that goes way back and it really creeps me out. So King Charles I, right now we're on the third, so we're taking it a couple back. King Charles I was tried for treason after the Civil War, and he ended up being beheaded in 1649. I guess in the 1600s, everyone was beheaded, so this wasn't necessarily abnormal, which is certainly weird, but that's a history lesson for another day. The weird part of this, however, is that apparently his head was sewn back on his body so that he could sit for a portrait, or it was perhaps supposed to be a sign of respect. Either way, it's very weird and very gross. I feel terrible for whoever's job it was to do that, and I also feel bad for the artist who was forced to paint that. Talk about traumatic. It does certainly make sense though that people say that Charles' ghost still haunts a building because there is no amount of haunting that could make up for being beheaded and then having your head sewn back onto your body. Okay, why'd we do the first part if we were gonna do the second? Could have just cut the middleman, you know? But instead, they cut his head off, okay? <laughs> in our number six spot today, we have never travel in pairs. 
This is one travel rule that certainly makes sense, but it is really dark when you think about it. This rule is one that the British royal family, and honestly many people who can afford this sort of luxury safety do nowadays. This tradition and rule is one that means that any heirs to the throne are not allowed to travel together. This is of course in case some sort of accident happens, not every heir to the throne would be injured or perhaps killed. It's definitely very smart and sensible, but it has got to be grim, just constantly preparing for the worst thing to happen. It is of the utmost importance to the royal family that they preserve the line to the throne. Like I mentioned before, however, other people are now taking a page out of the royal book and are using this travel rule where possible. In our number 5 spot today, we have the black outfit. Another travel rule that the royal family must follow is in regards to an item that they have to bring with them on all trips, whether business or pleasure. It is pretty unusual to see the royal family dressed in black, despite what a specific occasion calls for it, but every time they travel, they are required to bring an all black outfit with them. This is to prepare for the worst case scenario. If they are away on a trip and somebody important to them passes away, they need to ensure that they are ready with the appropriate clothing for when they are able to touch down on their home soil. This is of course very practical, but it's definitely kind of morbid. I mean, you're having to fuss over what you're going to wear when you're actually just mourning the loss of someone close to you. It certainly wouldn't be the top of my list of things to focus on, but maybe that's why I'm not cut out for royalty. Okay. In our number four spot today, we have the rules of the road. Okay. This like rule or tradition or law I guess is probably one of the craziest things I've ever heard but I guess it's been around for quite a while and I just had no idea. As it turns out, the monarch is the only person in the UK who is allowed to drive without a legal license or even license plates. Like. That's insane. I didn't expect the king to have to take a driver's test like everyone else, but just having a rule that allows them, if they chose to, to drive without any idea how? It's pretty bizarre. The good news is though, which makes this rule make a lot more sense, is that of course, rather than driving himself, King Charles' chauffeur will be much more responsible for most of the driving for the king. Let's just hope the chauffeur has their driver's license. I'm not gonna lie, there's this like silly photo of the queen, and every time I think about like the monarch driving without a license, I just think of this like little photo. She's got like a little silly grin on her face. She looks mischievous. And that's what I like to think, her just driving with no license. In our number three spot today, we have the armed forces. This is a tradition or system that comes into play when a new monarch comes into power. So last year, this happened with the king after the passing of the queen. It is definitely one of the most intimidating parts of his new role. And this is that King Charles now becomes the head of the armed forces. This means that it is his responsibility and he is the only person who can declare when the country is at war and when the war is over. Of course, he won't be doing this entirely alone. He needs to follow the advice and guidance of the government. The perhaps good news is that the new king has held quite close ties to the armed forces throughout his life, even spending time in the Royal Navy and taking flying instruction from the Royal Air Force during his second year at Cambridge University. Of course, the hope is that he won't have to be in a position to make these difficult decisions, but when or if he's faced with them, we can hope he makes the proper decisions for the country. In our number two spot today, we have no touching. There is a rule that you just cannot touch a royal. I'm sure there's a multitude of reasons for this, mostly to do with security, but aside from a very lucky handshake, you really are supposed to keep your distance. I suppose it's because I live the life of a regular person, but I kind of feel like in some ways this might be a little sad. I feel like you might be lacking in so much connection with a ton of interesting people. And like some of the people that you meet, wouldn't you just be dying to hug them? You know, apparently this is part of the reason why the queen always wore gloves. She of course shook a lot of hands while making her royal appearances, and the same will likely go for the new king. Maybe he'll take up gloves as a fashion accessory, just like his mother. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the church. We talked about the armed forces, and King Charles won't only be the head of the armed forces, but he will also become the head of the church in England. Quite a jump from talking about war and being the one who makes those kinds of decisions to being the head of the church where things hopefully are quite the opposite. This is a post that British monarchs have held since the church was founded by King Henry VIII in the 1500s, and it appears as though the tradition will carry on. In this role, it means that King Charles will be responsible for appointing archbishops and bishops to their role. The king will of course be advised in this role by the prime minister, and it is said that the king is religious in his own right, and that he has already spoken about how his personal faith has informed his approach to leadership. Kiss the hand, which will be our first 
point, believe it or not, kissing the hand or feet of a royal is a tradition that goes back to ancient times. Nowadays, the most remaining monarchies have tossed that tradition aside because, well, hygiene, it's annoying, people don't respect boundaries, and as a kid, nobody has ever liked that. Moroccan royalty, however, has hung on to the tradition. King Mohammed is a big old fan of this old timely custom and has ensured it is legally mandated. Come across a royal on accident? Hand kiss. Having a meeting? Hand kiss. Why talk to the hand when you can give it a little smoochy smooch? Anyways, they did recently have to ban it for the duration of the pandemic to protect the king, obviously, but as of late 2022, the law is back. Hilariously, his son, like all little kids, hates the whole kissing thing. In 2016, a video went viral of Prince Moulay Hassan whipping his hand away and refusing to have a kiss as he went down a line of visiting dignitaries greeting them. His father found humor in it and widely joked the hand kissing tradition will likely be retired with the prince. Imagine being so good at your job becomes law that you're locked into it for life. The Bureau of Astronomy for Lifers. In ancient China, the emperor was known as the son of heaven and society functioned off the concept that the emperor was God appointed. Naturally, the imperial government would regularly reinforce the idea of the emperor's divine right by using stories and symbolism that indicated heaven's pleasure at the emperor's leadership. The stories and symbolism came from astronomy, with the study equated to divining the future of the empire and its rulers. As of the Qin Dynasty, their government had special departments specifically for celestial phenomena, drawing up calendars, producing advice, and evidence. When Zhu Yuzhong, the first emperor of the Ming Dynasty, came to power, he was not only so impressed with the astronomers and their predictions, but also the ability to see past the normal eye. Why, hell, he decided the rules were needed to control the Imperial Bureau of Astronomy. These men were practically prophetic, and this skill invaluable. What if someone stole it? Or one of them wanted to quit and waste their brains on being a farmer instead? No, Zhu needed to make sure that under wraps and locked up for only the son of heaven's use. His rule bound all officials in the bureau to their posts, forbidding them from transferring to other departments, leaving for another position, or learning another position. And because it felt like it was such a supernatural skill, surely it must be in the lineage. So their descendants were also bound to astronomy and forbidden from engaging in other fields of work. They've got so little to talk about, it makes more sense to sit in silence. British royalty's list of permissible conversations has about as much flavor and depth as a boiled chicken breast, which the whole family kind of already looks like they eat for three meals a day anyways. But more on the British family and their notoriously spiceless food later. According to the former butler of Prince Charles named Grant Harold, the British royal family isn't supposed to discuss intercourse, religion, politics, or money, which are all incredibly relevant things for monarchs to be talking about. Literally all four of those things correlate with every facet of their title, job's existence, but okay prudes. It's against royal etiquette to discuss these subjects between royals commoners and royals or even for commoners who are just at a royal event. Prince Charles was apparently a regular breaker of this rule as proven in 2015 when The Guardian won the 10 year legal press for the release of the so called black spider letters. The queen herself has made many indirect references to political battles and naturally the media aired out Meghan Markle when she once whispered her approval on Ireland's vote to legalize the big aid for women. Instead Grant said it's advised to discuss travel and the weather only. This has got to be the most boring family on earth guys, I couldn't survive two minutes in that house. When you're royal you have the pick of the litter, but not without consequence. Much like Queen Elizabeth in the UK, the Emperor of Japan, currently Nahito, who took the throne in 2019 following the abdication of his father, Akito, does not play an active role in politics for the country, more so a mouthpiece. However, they still follow some of the most wildly uptight rules imaginable, and one of them is how female members of the Japanese royal family are forbidden from marrying commoners. You can marry who you love, absolutely, but baby girl, should it be a commoner, you have to forfeit the princess status for them. Once known as Princess Nori, now Sayako Kuroda, she took this step in 2005 when she married her older brother's longtime school friend. Princess Mako became engaged to Kamarua, former classmate in 2017, and addressed the press stating, from the time I was a child as aware upon marrying, I would give up my position as a member of the imperial household. Given that situation, I tried to assist the emperor and do whatever I could to fulfill my role as a member in the imperial household, while also valuing my own life. The two were wed in 2021, and Mako now works in New York City. Naturally, there are double standards. The same sacrifice was not required of Prince Akashino, the brother of Sayako, and he, when he married outside of the Japanese aristocracy. His wife is the daughter of a university professor. Ashiko's wife wasn't the first commoner woman to marry into the Japanese royal family, but she was the first from a middle class background and was subsequently harassed and dragged through the mud. A royal family that says, hey, leave the dog out of this. Thailand had a pre-existing law that if you insult the members of the royal family in any kind of way, keep in mind it's the royals themselves 
themselves that get to decide if you offended them. So you could really get in trouble for just like picking your nose near them. It could land you in prison. Each of the offenses is 15 years in prison too. And that trash talk can be in person, in writing, graffiti, or social media. Cue my example from 2015, a man named Thanacorn was charged by a military court for making a sarcastic internet post about Tong Dang, aka Copper, the much loved street dog that had been rescued by the king himself from an alley. In fact, she's so praised for her loyalty and obedience. Tong Dang is a household name. The king wrote and illustrated a book about her in 2002, and an animated film in 2015 called Kong Tai Dong, an inspiration, went, was second in the box office that year. And this regular everyday do, Thanacorn understandably rolls his eyes hardcore and let the jokes fly in a social media post about said movie. I guess he didn't realize the dog counted as a royal family member, and he went to prison for three months. But others have gone to prison for decades as the injured magistrate convictions have surged since Thailand's arc royalist generals seized power from the elected government in May of 2014. One man was jailed this year for 30 years for insulting monarchy on Facebook. Now for the legal obligation to be taken to the grave. Working for the pharaoh could be pretty lit as long as it wasn't forced captivity. If you were hired staff for arts, music, foods, hygiene, whatever, you'd be paid spectacularly, housed and fed well. Overall, you had a good go of it. Until there comes a day where every pharaoh gets mauled by a hippo and has to take a dust nap. Because of their strong belief in the afterlife, Egyptians were dedicated to ensuring that they carried the things they would need into said afterlife. Tools, cooking utensils, makeup, a brush, a long narrow glass bottle filled with buzzing bees. I see you, Cleopatra. In the case of pharaohs, who were considered to be the most important people alive, they required their workers, enslaved or contracted, in their afterlife if they were to continue living lives of comfort and luxury even after death. Many other individuals of high rank in ancient Egypt who had staffing would also often be buried with their workers the same as pharaohs, treated as if they were moving into a new house with their masters. And this was the rules. You were a servant, you were expected to go quietly, willingly. Hell, they wanted you to be so excited you practically threw yourself in the tomb and begged them to bury it. Before any of the pharaohs that are the most famous today came into power, however, the tradition underwent a change. Obviously, burying people in there is pretty cruel, and after a while, people got real sick of having to die when the pharaoh does. However, the pharaoh still requires servants in the afterlife to perform various menial tasks for them and maintain their palace. This led to the introduction of shakti, tiny carved figures that were placed within the tombs of the pharaohs. They're shaped like small mummies, and each of them had special details carved into them on what jobs and tasks they would have in the afterlife. Imagine pointing at a fish and going, hey, look, a fish, and its response is, oh, that is lord fish to you. Quite the case with carp, of all creature, literally the dirtiest little bottom feeders there are. They eat just about anything, thus earning their meme status as a garbage fish. However, carp, like koi, can be fortunate and seen as good luck. In fact, talking about carp the way I just did could get you in massive trouble during the Tang Dynasty, because carp has the same pronunciation as the Tang Emperor's last name, Li. According to the miscellanea of Yu Yang, which is a record of legends, folk customs, and herbal remedies in the Tang Dynasty, carp had to be referred to as Lord Red Carp to show respect to the imperial family. Also, those who happen to catch carp should relieve the fish immediately. It's not acceptable to eat them, and those who sell them will be flogged 60 times. However, like all legal provisions, this law was only as good as its enforcement, and judging by the amount of Tang poets who wrote about catching and eating carp without any record of punishment, seems like this law was very loose. Emperor Renzong of the Yuan Dynasty he had a similar idea as his Tong predecessors. The Yuan Dynasty historian Yang Yu recorded in historical notes that during the Rangzong reign, people in the capital were not allowed to hold chickens upside down. Offenders would be convicted, probably because the emperor's zodiac sign was a chicken. Now it's China's shorty selection system in the Forbidden City. Inside the Forbidden City, most women were maids and servants, but there were the notorious concubines. Their task was to bear children to the emperor, as many as he could father, because that's what he was focusing on when walking into a harem of women who couldn't say no to him and were also the the baddest biddies the empire had to offer. Anyways, women were selected for the court as early as the Jin Dynasty, and the aesthetic selection criteria did range from emperor to emperor. According to law, all young unmarried women went through the selection process. Only girls who were married or had a certified physical disability or physical deformity were exempt. Whenever selection time rolled around, the Board of Revenue sent notices to the officials in the capital and the provincial garrisons to enlist the help of the clan heads. The banner officials then submitted a list of all available 
available females to the commander's headquarters, and they set the date. During the Qing Dynasty, girls were brought on the appointed day to the Shenwu Gate of the Forbidden City for inspection. They'd be accompanied by their parents, nearest relatives, together with their clan heads or local officials. Social background was actually no barrier, and many emperors chose concubines from the general public. The empress was the one exception, she had to be for a high ranking official. Less than a hundred candidates would be selected to spend the nights with women who specialize in training and managing maids. Candidates' bodies were inspected for infections, body hair, body odor. Think of that beginning scene in Mulan, as stereotypical as that is to say. They advanced through two more levels of concubine boot camp, weeding out the weak, America's next top model style, and finally, the selected few would take their lives as easy baked baby ovens. Womp womp. Next. Imagine someone wants to make sure you like the food, so they find a way to measure your enjoyment. Literally, measure it. Like, get on a scale, big boy, it's time for your weigh in. Absolutely crazy. So, listen to this. According to a 2018 Grazia Daily article with the representative of British Windsor family, before and after Christmas dinner, everyone gets weighed. Ho ho ho, jolly occasion. The weird tradition apparently dates back to King Edward VII's reign in the early 1900s. His Majesty was apparently concerned about the people's health and whether or not they're eating well enough on Christmas. So, each person attending this dinner is required to get weighed on a pair of antique scales both before and after eating. If they gain in weight, it signals they truly enjoy themselves at the table and the king did his job. Oh yeah, and you are obligated to know how much you weigh too before and after, so don't think you can ceiling stare your way through this one. The tradition was depicted in a scene in the 2021 film Spencer, in which Princess Diana, played by Kristen Stewart, understandably tweaks a little and expresses her distaste over the entire debacle. Pop off as usual, Princess D. Some other fun royal Christmas tr activities are the guests are expected to enter the room in order of seniority, whatever the hell that means, and wear paper hats even though the queen doesn't have to wear one. And last but not least, rules are meant to be broken. Like all monarchies, Spain does have its royal protocols, and they regulate the normal stuff, how you talk, walk, dress, the elegance in which you hold your regal frame. Spain has these royal protocols alright, and we know that because Queen Letizia is constantly making headlines for breaking them flagrantly and with a smirk ever since her husband was crowned. In 2014, royal watchers gasped when she wore a little black dress with a short, short skirt that was see-through all the way up to her mid-thigh. Conservative royals frowned that when she wore a sleeveless dress to a formal dinner. She wears pants and shorts and <gasps> sweatpants. She forgoes traditional shawls and enormous hair cones for Brandy Melville and cute ponytails with highlights. Stylistically, the previously divorced commoner and formal journalist, which I have to add because you know that was hella drama when she was made queen, is basically the opposite of her mother-in-law who's now Spain's former queen, Sofia. Lizia probably takes extra delight in flaunting their differences since the two hate each other with a passion and have gotten in shouting matches in public. Trust Lizia to put the queen in queen. Number 10. The Pressure as much as the royal family's existence is a complete sham, the power that is given to them by their adoring idiot public must reflect poorly on the nerves of the staff. Like it or not, which I don't, these losers are the face of an entire country. And so if you make a mistake while working for them, suddenly you've just spit in the country's face. There have been a number of instances where members of the staff have come forth with stories of what it's like to work for these middle-aged children, and every single time it's been embarrassing. Most of them are going to be sources of points on this list, but hey, you know, the pay's worth it, right? Number 9. How to Call the Queen to Dinner On June 3rd, 2011, a documentary was released detailing exactly what it's like to work as a royal servant. It details the hardships faced by members of the staff, but one stood out to me in particular because of just how utterly pathetic it was. In the documentary, one former staff member recalled how he'd called the queen to dinner by stating, your dinner's ready. Oh my goodness, how could he say that? Doesn't this loathe some worm know that the proper way to call baby for Din Din is to clearly state your majesty dinner is served. Oh, and you'd better not forget their bib, lest baby make boom boom. But hey, the bay's probably worth it, right? Number 8. No vacuums. One of the stranger rules that is inflicted on the staff is the demand that they do not use a vacuum cleaner until after 10 a.m. This means that when cleaning the entirety of that oversized eyesore of a palace, it must be done by sweeping until everyone is ready for their ears to withstand the atrocious assault made by such horrid machinery. Have you ever actually like swept a floor in your life? Do you know how long that takes? And in a house of that size? Well, there's being polite, but like, come on. Well, I mean, come on. At least the pay's worth it, right? 
Number seven, catering to their whims. These are slightly less defined, but it's generally well known that every single member of the royal family has their own peculiar quirks. As a result, every single royal aide must memorize the exact needs of a family member and conduct themselves accordingly. This has been famously catalogued in Margaret's human ashtrays, people who accompanied her solely to ensure that she did not have to think about where she was ashing her cigarette. Better remember which exact fruits these people like at which exact state of rottenness and temperature or you're out of a job. And yes, this also includes the dogs. There's a butler for the dogs. But hey, at least the pay is worth it, right? Number six, tactical dinner planning maps. To the royal staff, dinner isn't just a fact of life, it's an arrangement. Everything must be perfect every single time. And reportedly, that's still down to the little old thing of memorizing what everyone actually wants and where. As a result, there are supposedly literal maps that are printed out that must be followed to a T for every single dinner, or I presume someone will throw a temper tantrum. But hey, at least the pay is worth it, right? Number five, walking rules. It just, it does, I don't even know. The hits just don't stop coming with these weirdos. It, okay, it's a staff rule to never walk down the center of any corridor because it might wear down the material. This is something that the staff is required to do. I, I love it. Not only that, but whenever the ruler is in any room, if they're standing, you're standing. You can only sit when they sit. This just go this goes for everyone. Why? Why does this matter? What have these people actually done to deserve this respect? The the pace. It's absolutely worth it, right? Number four, food. I cannot imagine cooking for the royal family. I think I would actually rather just die. Apparently, anything that could even potentially cause food poisoning just cannot be on the menu. So, no shellfish, basically nothing from the ocean. Uh, this doesn't just go for the royals either. As former chef Darren McGrady described his role pertained to ensuring that the diets of the queen's dogs were as healthy as possible. Not only that, but he apparently was even responsible for selecting the carrots the queen would feed her horses based on length. Because if it was too short, the horse could nip her finger and give her majesty an ouchie. Ooh. But hey, at least the pay is worth it, right? Number three, don't be seen or heard. Despite being the only things that are allowing these psychos' lives to run properly, the expectation levied on the royal servants is simply that they just must be invisible. Think about everything I just mentioned. Now, think about how you have to do all of this without being seen or heard. No complaining, or they might start to think that you don't like your job. Of course, if you hear them say anything, and you will, you better not remember it, or you'll be a traitor to the country. And then you could sell their secrets to the press and make thousands, but you really wouldn't want to do that because, I mean, think about how much money you're already making with this good job that you have. Right? Number two, dealing with King Tampon. Not even the hardest thing to write on this list by a long shot. Yeah, King Charles has been reported to be an absolute nightmare to work for during his career. One report claimed that when he lost a cufflink in the bathroom, he supposedly smashed a sink to pieces in his quest to find it again. Another report claims that he demands his post-hunting snack be soft-boiled eggs. But since hunting trips are, you know, difficult to plan exact times around, the staff will make eggs every three minutes during the half hour that he's generally expected to return and just throw out the ones that have gotten too cold. If you don't believe me, look at the footage of Chuck gesturing for the aide to move stuff off of his desk. Look at how pathetic this man is. Really sear it into your brain exactly how worthless of a human being he is. Now call him the king, you peasant. But hey, the, the pay's good, right? Number one, 
the pay. You knew where this was going, but you probably didn't know exactly how much. The average royal servant makes around 1,800 pounds annually. That translates to roughly 20,000 United States dollars and 27,000 Canadian dollars. Way below living wage. I have actually, and I am not being hyperbolic here, I have worked dishwashing jobs in downtown restaurants that have paid far better salaries than this. I know they get to live on the premise. I know they get free meals and I don't care. Selling your life away to live for the whims of a bunch of incestuous old rich white people in the world's most opulent retirement home is one thing, but selling it for cheap is too much. The work and training that these staff members have to go through is insanely rigorous. They are living other people's lives as a profession, and they are being paid what is absolutely next to nothing. I don't care how many cute little handouts Meghan Markle gave her assistant or whatever. This is inhuman, and it is just disgusting. Well, I've gotten that out of my system. Number 10, King Edward VIII. Directly after his father died in 1936, King Edward VIII took the throne, right? That's pretty normal. But the tides quickly turned when, less than a year later, he renounced his position. Now, this was of course a huge scandal right off the bat. This is not something that's taken lightly in the royal family. Turns out the woman responsible for stealing his heart was that of Wallace Simpson, American socialite who had already been divorced once before and was at this point working through her second divorce. So you can only imagine how everybody reacted at that point, right? Oh, how dare she? His proposal to Simpson, of course, caused social and political backlash. The Church of England wasn't so chill with Edward marrying someone who had already been divorced. Yeah, they're not really okay with that. So Edward was forced to abdicate. Yeah, he had to, right, for love. Edward and Simpson then tied the knot in 1937, and they stayed together until Edward's death much later in 1972. Sliding into royal DMs right off the hop. Okay, we're in for a treat. Number nine, dark predictions. Of course, in recent years, the royal family has seen a change that many didn't really expect. When Harry and Meghan chose to renounce their royalty status, speculation began that this could be the beginning of the end for the monarchy. People only fueled their fire with questions and also, somebody may have called it. Yeah, not Stradamus. He may have predicted this entire event. One of his predictions literally reads, at the end of the war, the great powers change. Near the coast are born three beautiful children. They will ruin the town when they come of age. They will change the kingdom and they will not see it grow anymore. Now, Harry is only one of two children, so I'm not sure if the, you know, quote was talking about him and his siblings or if it has more to do so with some other royal family members. But either way, there's some people who take Nostradamus' words very, very seriously out there. So I had to include it. Maybe there's something there. I don't know. Maybe there's something we haven't quite breaking down yet. That's why we need National Treasure 3. You know, maybe this is the plot. Number eight, King Henry II. While we're on the topic of him, could Nostradamus have actually predicted the death of King Henry II? Because if he did, that's pretty uh, that's pretty curious, I'd say. Never used the word curious in my life, but I'm like, you know what, that's curious. King Henry II was actually a personal acquaintance of the prophet himself. That'd be kind of cool, being friends with Nostradamus. I'd be like, hey, how does Game of Thrones end? Please. While at one point in history, Nostradamus was seen addressing King Henry II as the most invincible King Henry of France, unfortunately, Henry proved to be quite invincible when he met his gruesome death, might I add, at age 40. Yeah, in the summer of 1559, not a great time. A terrible jousting accident went wrong and left the king passing away shortly after from sepsis. This is a terrible story, but I have to explain because, you know, it's history and well, that's what we're here for. The jousting accident saw the king having splinters driven into his eye and then his skull as well by one of his young soldiers. And the Nostradamus quote reads, the young lion will overcome the older one. It says he will pierce his eyes through a golden cage. Okay, already we're a little bit spooky. And that two wounds will ensure a cruel death. So I'm not saying he predicted it, I'm just saying, Kind of nailed it. Number seven, a fateful turn of events. Queen Victoria, her reign began back in 1837 and it lasted until the queen's death in 1901. Now at just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. Had to, right? All these cases, it's like, yeah, they have to do this. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819. And Queen Victoria was actually fifth in line when she was born, nowhere near the throne. So right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever see the crown. But one by one, all of her family members began passing away fast. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away, and then her father and her grandfather both died one week apart from one another. So, 
On one hand, obviously it's sad, it's tragic, everyone's dealing with loss so fast. But on the other hand, by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old, and already she was next up to bat for the throne at 11. Imagine, that's like some ancient Egypt. Number six, the Great Irish Famine. The Great Irish Famine took out many, many people. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on were suddenly no longer available. See, a group of microorganisms wiped them out, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. Now, it was draconian law and British ruling at this point that made the exported food hard to reach people. That's where things stopped. This famine led to Irish independence, of course, and anti-union movements. And the show Victoria pulled back zero punches in 2017, where an episode showed the true happenings behind the Great Irish Famine and the role that Queen Victoria played in coming to the aid of her then subjects. It was the death of at least one million people. This was a very dark seven years in Irish history. Historian Christine Keenley spoke out and says, quote, there is no evidence that she had any real compassion for the Irish people in any way. Yikes. That's a historian saying that. That's, that's, that's how you know. Number five, Meghan Markle, solo strut. Okay, back in May 2018, we all set our alarms, we woke up early, and we all watched the royal wedding, right? We sipped our tea in our pajamas and we pretended like we were there, right? Just watching, along with the other billions of people online. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, his new duchess. At the historic wedding, Thomas Markle was just a no-show. Yeah, Meghan has walked down that aisle by herself in front of a billion people, watching at home or streaming it, and it was thought at the time that this was because of Thomas's health. See, right before the wedding, Thomas suffered a heart attack, right? Just days before. So of course nobody was upset. It was almost expected for him not to show up. But cut to a year later, we began talking again. Thomas and the Duchess are now not close, it seems. Thomas even spoke out against his own daughter at one point. There was a huge scandal where Meghan even spoke to Oprah, like Oprah and that big tell-all. And Meghan actually said to her father, if you tell me the truth about working with paparazzi, we can help. And he wasn't able to do that, and for me, has really resonated, especially now as a mother, end quote. So yeah, they're not talking, I guess, anymore. Which, more than fair. If my dad was working with the paparazzi, showing them private letters, I'd be a little pissed too. There's no way though, the guy can't even unlock his email, let alone sending one, no way. Number four, Prince Charles and Princess Diana's divorce. Prince Charles, the oldest son of the queen, straight up admitted to having an affair with Camilla Parker before his divorce from his first wife, of course, Princess Diana. Imagine having a, like, this is crazy, a princess? You cheated on a princess? That's insane. So in turn, Princess Diana addressed the relationship and what's happening during, you know, that famous 1995 interview with BBC. She couldn't have said it better, if I'm being honest. Diana said herself, quote, while there's three of of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Yeah, end quote. There's no better way of putting it, I think. That's a pretty, it's a pretty baller way of saying it. I don't know. I haven't said baller in like 13 years, but I'm like, you know what? That's a baller move. It's pretty gangster. Diana also said she was in love with riding instructor Major James Hewitt during her marriage to Charles, so everybody was busy looking other directions, it seems. Diana and Charles divorced in 1996, only one year before her tragic car accident. Now, later in 2005, Charles ended up marrying Camilla. Has anyone seen Spencer? Kristen Stewart looked great in that movie, and now I wanna watch it. Is it worth the watch? Let me know in the comments. I didn't see you go to theaters or anything. Kind of snuck by me while I was sleeping on all the good ones. Number three, Prince Harry costume party. YouTube isn't a fan of some words, specifically one word that rhymes with Yahtzee, and it goes deep with history, as you could assume what I'm talking about. But with this being one of the biggest scandals, I have to bring it up, right? The Duke was always referred to as a bad boy, right? He was the bad royal, the bad boyal royal. I don't know, I'm trying new shit here. But just how deep did these incidents cut? Well, before he settled down with Meghan in 2018, Harry had to issue a public apology back in 2005 because, uh, whoops, somebody got photos from a costume party and a uh, few of them were in poor taste. Did the royal dress up as the beast from Beauty and the Beast? No, no he did not. Did he dress up like a witch? Like a little witch, uh, maybe with a, with a nice witch broom? No, none of that either. No, photos leaked of him wearing World War II German soldier gear. Yeah, I can't say too much, but it was even equipped with an armband, a very bad armband. Again, I can't say too much, you know, nor will YouTube allow us to show too much, but you understand what I'm trying to say. You remember. It was poor taste. He could have dressed up in any way he wanted. He's a literal prince. And he does this, 
It's off-putting. Harry said afterwards, and I quote, I am very sorry if I caused any offense or embarrassment to anyone. It was a poor choice of costume and I apologize. End quote. Nice, right from the heart, that's good. Really goes deep with the royal history. We love it. Number two, Vegas getaway. Nice, roll those dice. It's one thing to party like a rock star, but to party like a prince? What does that even mean? I gotta keep this Prince Harry train going because, well, now I'm mad at him, but there's even more photos from history that show what was really going down in the royal family, you know? His priorities, dare I say. After that party incident, just seven years later, scandalous photos emerged from Harry's Las Vegas trip. Yeah, I had a little boys night, it seems. It turns out what happens in Vegas may just leak online for your entire family to see and your grandmother. That's probably not a great time. These scandalous pics were taken during a strip pool game. Lovely, we like that. Make sure you call the right pocket while you're not wearing any. The scandal actually prompted St. James Palace to contact the Press Complaints Commission before the snaps even made their way to British tabloids. Yeah, they knew right off the bat they were fucked. They're like, uh, can we call them? Can we send a pigeon? What's the fastest? And finally, number one, Boy Jones and other attempts. Okay, being the queen and all in history, a security team is always needed, obviously. And during her reign, specifically Queen Victoria, there were multiple attempts to harm the young queen. First attack was in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford and he fired towards the queen's carriage. When Edward was accused of high treason, of course, afterwards, he was actually found not guilty due to, you guessed it, insanity. A couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her, both also Missed. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, might I add, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook. Then these incidents kept occurring again in 1842, 1849, and 1872. Attempt after attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse, and dare I say, a little bit more weird. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened there, I saved it for last because it's so, so horribly creepy. I teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841, and his name was Edward Jones. Edward Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once, right? Before Assassin's Creed came out. No idea how we thought of this. Guy just knows the route in, and he would break in and would hide under the queen's sofa. That was his go-to spot. Or he would sometimes just sit on her throne. And one of the worst things ever, sometimes he would go through her drawers. He would go through the queen's drawers. That's so gross. What? Like that's... That's so, that's gross. He would steal her clothes until eventually, and thankfully, he got caught. Starting off at our number 10 spot, we have Isabella of France. Back in 1313, Isabella, the daughter of King Philip IV of France, made a gift for a group of noble women that her brothers were marrying. She gifted the three women these embroidered purses, and as it turns out, these gifts would soon lead to their demise. Basically, the following year after giving these gifts, Isabella spotted two of these purses in the possession of a pair of knights. You can probably already see where this is going, but of course Isabella was suspicious of this now, so she passed on the information to her father. From here, he had people watch the wives of his sons as a sort of investigation. Soon, two of the wives were found guilty of adultery with the knights, and it was discovered that an old guard tower acted as their secret meeting place. The women were placed into prison for the rest of their lives, and the men met gruesome fates that ensured they paid for their disloyalty. This had lasting repercussions, however, because with their wives in prison, the king's sons now didn't produce any male heirs before they passed away, and thus the Hundred Years' War was born when the son of Isabella, Edward III of England, attempted to claim the French throne. In our number nine spot today, we have the Prince of Brunei. Brunei's prince, Geoffrey Bulkia, is the brother to the Sultan, and a few years ago, he found himself in quite the scandal. Basically, in 1997, Shannon Marketic accused the prince and the Sultan of flying her and many others to Brunei under false pretenses. In this scandal, everyone escaped any kind of charges due to diplomatic immunity. Then we move to 2000, where the Sultan himself sued his brother for apparently embezzling $14.8 million from the Brunei Investment Agency, which is in charge of things like their oil revenues. While he denies the charges, he agreed to hand over a number of his personal belongings to the government in exchange for avoiding criminal prosecution and being allowed to stay at his residence. This was quite messy for the outwardly luxurious prince, but since then, it doesn't seem as though any major scandals have come to light, and the Sultan remains one of the last absolute monarchs in the world. In our number eight 
spot today, we have Ferdinand the First, the king of Naples from 1458 to 1494. Ferdinand was looked on quite fairly as a leader, but he was also known for being quite a ruthless leader in a lot of aspects as well. He was 35 years old when he came into power, and in 1485, he was faced with a revolt among the nobility. Ferdinand quickly put a stop to this, but promised the nobility a general amnesty before later turning against them and executing a number of them. For the most significant offenders against Ferdinand, however, he had quite a specific treatment for them. After their slaying, the king would have these enemies embalmed, dressed, and then posed in his quote, black museum. This seems like a weird hobby you probably would want to keep hidden, but not Ferdinand. He loved it and was so proud of it. He would even take his guests on a tour of the place if he suspected that they may be treacherous. In our number 7 spot today, we have Louis XIV. During the reign of Louis XIV, poison was one of those things you just really had to worry about. It was on the rise as an easy and sneaky way to take people out and change the course of inheritance and influence. Because of the worries surrounding possible poisonings and stories of people close to the king doing some shady stuff, investigations began. It was soon found out that the king's chief mistress, the Marquis de Montspan, was said to be quite the client of Catherine Monvoisin. Catherine was a Parisian salesperson who sold powders and potions that were meant to catch the attention of the king. You know, love potion stuff. But among these love potion stories were also stories of horrifying rituals and rites of practice in order to get these alleged powers. These stories, of course, terrified the king, and this led to him ordering for Catherine to be burned at the stake. And not only this, but hundreds of others were implicated as well. Some passed from the conditions they were being held under, others were executed, and some saw punishments that spared their lives, but their reputations were for ever tarnished. For the chief mistress, however, well, although she was connected to this entire ordeal, she was the mother of several of the king's children, and because of this close connection to the king, she wasn't arrested or tried. Instead, though, she was retired and sent to a convent to live the rest of her life. In our number six spot today, we have Sophia Dorothea, daughter of the Duke of Brunswick Lundberg. She was betrothed to her first cousin, George. Now, history says that George wasn't the most attractive man with the nickname Pig Snout, but George was in quite a position where he was potentially the heir to two thrones. So of course, the Duke agreed to hand his daughter over in hopes of her securing a crown. Princess Sophia obviously did not like this and apparently fainted when she heard of the betrothal in 1682. The marriage did go through, but things went downhill quite quickly and turned very violent. Flash forward to the time when Count von Konigsmark arrived from Sweden and suddenly, Sophia had a new interest. Not long after his arrival, the pair were having quite the affair that wasn't exactly as discreet as you might might have assumed. The pair made a plan to run away together and make a new life far, far away from Pig Snout. Unfortunately, however, the night before the pair were supposed to run off, the Count just disappeared. There are plenty of theories of what might have happened to the Count, including a jealous former lover and, of course, George. In the end, the rumors were swirling and George was super mad about it, so he divorced Sophia, took the kids, and sent her to be imprisoned in a small castle on the lake. In the end, George went on to become King George I of England, and he left Sophia behind. In our number 5 spot today, we have Marie Antoinette. In 1783, an artist painted a portrait of Marie Antoinette. This would go on to become one of the most scandalous royal portraits of all time because of the dress that she was wearing. The dress, a gall, wasn't the regular restrictive court dress and instead was something that the queen would normally wear as she strolled around the grounds of Versailles privately. This comfortable dress, however, was a little bit too scandalous for the public at the time because it resembles a form of undergarment worn to protect expensive clothing. Basically, to the public, it looked like the queen had just been painted in her underwear. Not only were people upset that she didn't upkeep this sort of mystique of luxury and royalty, but the fabric the gown was made from was also quite controversial. The cotton dress was heavily associated with the slave trade and was looked on as a British fabric, which was horrible for a French queen to be wearing. The painting was quickly taken down, but the damage was already done. Within the next decade, the queen would meet her demise at the hands of the guillotine. In our number 4 spot today, we have Atahualpa and Huascar. These two were the two sons of the Inca king, but when he passed away in 1527, the kingdom was left to the 
sons, but their joint rule did not turn out so well. By 1529, war had broken out and things were going downhill. What would later become known as the War of the Two Brothers saw many horrors, and apparently one brother at one point made a drinking cup out of the skull of one of the other brother's generals. The civil war that the two started would definitely speed up the downfall of the civilization, but things met an even crazier end. Just as Atahualpa seemed close to declaring his victory in 1532, Francisco Pizarro's Spanish conquistadors showed up and captured him to hold him for ransom. During this time, he was still able to get out a message to execute his brother. In the end, while he outlived his brother, it wouldn't be by much because he was then executed by the Spanish in 1533. In our number 3 spot today we have Richard III. There are many questions surrounding this king's rise to power because, well, it seems sketchy at best. When King Edward IV died in 1483, he left behind two sons. The eldest of the two, Edward V, was too young to rule on his own, so the sons were to be looked after and to be advised by Richard III, the late king's brother. Well, something strange happened after just 68 days when the sons were sent to the Tower of London and then were never heard from again. Of course, this meant that Richard III needed to take over the throne. To this day, no one knows exactly what happened to the sons as they have never been found. Was this just a tragic coincidence, or is Richard III a usurper? Richard met his fate in battle just two years later and took these secrets with him to the grave. In our number 2 spot today we have the Wanli Emperor. The 13th Emperor of China's Ming Dynasty, Wanli, had many relations with women. He is said to have had two official consorts and a number of concubines, but one of these ladies was clearly his favourite, Lady Zheng. She had two sons and one of them, Wanli, really wanted to be his successor. Unfortunately, this son was the third of his children so his ministers and those around him wouldn't allow it. They believed he wasn't the proper heir. In the end, the first son of Wan Li, who was born to consort Lady Wang, was declared the crown prince. This is when the emperor decided that since he didn't have his way, he was just going to quit working. Prior to this entire dilemma, Wan Li was looked upon as a great ruler. He worked hard and he handled the threats to the empire very quickly. This was all extremely contradictory to the final 20 years of his reign, where he apparently just started ignoring meetings and royal duties. This is why many historians actually place a lot of the blame for the downfall of the Ming Dynasty in 1644 to this sort of passive aggressive protest. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have Joan of Kent. Joan of Kent lived during the 14th century in England, and she was known as being one of the most beautiful women in all of England. She was said to be quite loving, but it is also said that she had quite a whirlwind and controversial love life. So basically, Joan was only 12 when she had her first marriage. I know it's horrifying now, but this was the practice at the time, and she married a knight named Tom Holland. But when Tom went off to war, Joan was approached by another man, the son of the Earl of Salisbury, who asked asked for her hand in marriage. Despite the whole Tom situation, she said yes, because at the time there was no way for anyone to know who would be coming back from battle, and she just assumed that Tom had died. It was of course quite the shock to everyone when Tom ended up returning, very much alive, to find out about all of this. A legal battle followed which Tom ended up winning, and him and Joan went on to raise four children. After his passing, however, Joan would go on to marry again, to the dismay of many people. But this time, she married the son of King Edward III, and she went on to become the first Princess of Wales. Kicking off our list at number 10, Princess Diana. We'll start with a tragedy right off the gate. Here we go. Prince Charles, the oldest son of the Queen, he straight up admitted to having an affair with Camilla right before his divorce from his first wife, Princess Diana. So in turn, Princess Diana addressed that relationship and what exactly happened. During that famous 1995 interview with BBC, she couldn't have said it better if I'm being honest myself. Diana said, very confidently, well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. That's a Princess Diana roast, folks. Oh no! Yeah, Princess Diana, she's full of roasts, apparently. Diana also said she was in love with riding instructor Major James Hewitt during her marriage to Charles, so everybody was a little busy, it seemed, and rightfully so. Diana's like, yeah, I'm not hanging out with this guy. Diana and Charles divorced in 1996, only a year before her tragic accident took her life. Later in 2005, he married Camilla. Yeah, has anybody seen Spencer? Kristen Stewart looks great in that movie, and I wanna know if it's worth the watch. Comment down below. Number nine, The Great Fire. One of the most wild Nostradamus predictions of all time. 
It reads, The blood of the just will commit a fault at London, burnt through lightning of 23's the 6th. The ancient lady will fall from her high place. Several of the same sect will be killed. Now, there are of course many people who believe that this entry here was actually one that predicted the Great Fire of London that occurred in 1666. The line 23 is the 6 and times 20 by 3 and then you add 6, you get 66. Right? Quick math. But most importantly, it may also mention London and the royal family. And in real life, this fire did affect them as well. Also, it is said by many that the reference to the lady here is another term for the kingdom, the lady. This means that Nostradamus was predicting, maybe, that the kingdom was going to fall as a result of the Great Fire. So, yeah, he kind of nailed it. I don't know. Number eight, King James. Not to be confused with LeBron James, although he's, he's a pretty good king as well. He's, he's all right, that fellow. This is a different king. In an official 16th century medical book, the actual medical advice at one point was to not bathe. Don't do it or else you're a sinner, I guess. Use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body and maketh the venomous air to enter and for to infect the blood. First of all, what? What did you just say? Why is every shred of medical knowledge from the past always written in riddles, like it's a Harry Potter spell, you know what I mean? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century. A doctor is like, ah, yes, just a, a flower petal. We'll fix that. The doctor was one of these comes in. No way. Not listening to that guy. They thought that taking a bath would make you sick. So King James IV, apparently, he never took a bath. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass on lice to others just by walking by them. He would walk by and they'd be like, Ugh. Guy's got Steven Tyler's hair. What is that? Like, can we cut it if it's infected with gross? Can we just, maybe a bald king? How does a bald king sound? Number seven, King Rudolph II. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552, he was known as a collector of sorts, these, these royals. They like to collect things, they like to spend their money on weird things. Some princes collect stamps, other collect zoo animals. See, his castle was home to lions, tigers, and orangutans, so good luck getting a full eight hours of sleep, my friends. He also collected human artifacts, this royal, so that's a bit odd to collect when you're a royal. Imagine having company over, you're like, yeah, watch the lion crap, and also don't mind the jars of eyes. Do you want a drink? Let me get you a drink. King Rudolph II, okay, he's quite important in history, obviously. He supported the scientific revolution a lot, and he also poured tons of money into astrology, so he was into cool stuff. Number six, Prince Harry costume party. YouTube doesn't like when I say some words, specifically a word that rhymes with Yahtzee. Mm -hmm. But with this being one of the biggest scandals, I have to bring it up, I have to mention it. The Duke was also referred to as a bad boy, but just how deep did these incidents cut? Was he like topless on a beach and he's bad, or was he dressed up as something horrible at a Halloween party? It was the latter. Before he settled down with Meghan in 2018, Harry had to issue a public apology in 2005 because, huh, whoops, somebody got photos from that party. Did the royal dress up as the Beast from Beauty and the Beast? No. Did he dress up like a witch? No, it would have been fun, but no. Photos leaked of him wearing a World War II German soldier outfit. Can't say much here, but it was even equipped with a specific armband. Yeah, we can't show you either, but you get what I'm saying. This was a not great time. It was poor taste. He could have dressed up in any way. He's a royal, and he does this instead. I don't know, it's very off-putting. Harry said afterwards, quote, I am very sorry if I caused any offense or embarrassment to anyone. End quote. Wow, he, he really meant that one. Really came from the heart, that, that, that apology. It was a poor choice of costume and I apologize, he says. Okay, number five, King Henry II. This is a quote that people believe was Nostradamus predicting the death of King Henry II, who actually was a personal acquaintance of the prophet himself. That'd be scary. Hey, uh... How do I tell you this? Well, at one point, Nostradamus was seen addressing King Henry II as the most invincible Henry King of France. Unfortunately, Henry proved to be quite invincible when he met his gruesome death at the age of 40. In the summer of 1559, a terrible jousting accident went awry and left the king passing away shortly after from sepsis. This is a terrible story, but I told you it because many think that Nostradamus predicted this. The jousting incident saw the king having splinters driven into his eye and his skull by one of his young soldiers. And the Nostradamus quote reads, the young lion will overcome the older one. Yeah, he's jousting and then the eye, and then it happened. That sucks. Number four, Prince Charles the Vampire. Now, some of these theories, yeah, they're a bit out there. I didn't make them up. I wish I did, but I didn't. Some believers out there actually think Prince Charles is a vampire, a blood-sucking, flying, turning into a bat-looking vampire. I don't know. 
Why? Because Prince Charles is related to Vlad the Impaler. You know, that 15th century ruler who inspired the story of Dracula in Transylvania, who we're all pretty sure was a vampire. Now, it's a fun theory that went about, but Prince Charles having a piece of Romania is definitely helping out this case. I, we kind of believe this. The prince has been conserving forests and he even got property over there. So maybe he's a vampire, maybe not. Maybe he just likes property and castles and Vlad the Impaler. I heard he's a great lad, a great Vlad. Number three, shapeshifters. Awesome. I'm not actually Taylor. I'm someone else pretending to be. That's cool. That's why I'm so energetic today. This next theory I wish I could claim for my own again, but it was actually former BBC presenter David Ick. He takes the he takes the cake himself. Here we go. He has since revealed himself as a conspiracy theorist, and one that surrounds the royal family had me stunned. Ick and quite a few others claim that the royal family is part of the Illuminati. Yeah, and then all of them earn their power because their human ancestor mated with Reptilian aliens. They were clapping alien reptilians. That's how they became royals. That's the trick. You gotta clap some reptilian alien. David says the theory actually explains why royal families are obsessed with keeping their bloodlines clean with other royals. And you know, incest. <clears throat> but the biggest what the f part of all this has to be when David told the public that he knows people who have seen royal family members change into reptiles and then back into human form again. Number two, leaked letters. We'll end with some recent leaked letters. We love those, we love some gossip. We mentioned Princess Diana, well, we've got more stuff, we've got more tea. In May 2018, the royal wedding, it was thought at the time that Meghan's father was absent because of a heart attack that he suffered days before. But a year or so later, it's revealed that Thomas Markle and the new Duchess weren't as close. There was some, uh, there was some drama, there was some beef going on in the family. Thomas spoke out against his own daughter. There was a scandal where Meghan spoke to Oprah, the tell-all that we all watched, and Meghan actually said to her father that if you tell me the truth about what happened, about working with paparazzi, then we can help and get through it. But he wasn't able to do that, and that for me has really resonated. Yeah, if my dad was working with paparazzi, showing them private letters as well, just for clout, I'd be upset too, as if my dad can't even open his iPad without me, let alone leak my letters. Number one, personal sheet changer. I can't tell if this is the worst thing ever or the best, but it's, it's kept me laughing for months now. Royals have been sweating constantly about other people trying to, you know, take them out, right? It's a scary job, everyone wants to attack you. I mentioned Boyd Jones on here a few times, the guy that stalked the queen. It's terrifying, people are terrifying. Boyd Jones would go through the queen's drawers and you know, big ooh. So historically, the royal family would try their best to anticipate any and all attacks. Be as safe as you can be, right? Of course. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Oh, have you heard about these kissing sheets, this royal position? A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned them, that's normal. But they also had a guy who would get tucked in the king's sheets. I would much rather have the latter, know what I mean? King Henry VIII hired somebody to make sure the bed wasn't poisoned. So you were required to make the king's bed every morning, but you also had to rub all the sheets down everywhere before bedtime. You'd have to kiss the bed sheets to make sure they weren't poisoned. Yeah, sleep tight. I'll sleep here, boss. Here we go. Don't, don't mind the old medieval dad breath all over your pillows. You're safe for the night. That's so gross. I can't even sleep in a hotel sometimes, let alone some dude. I'm like, what are you doing? Get this guy out of here. Why is he kissing my bed? Clothes as well. That was also touched. Maybe not kissed, but it was for sure touched. Guys wearing my clothes in my bed, kissing my sheets. No way. I think I'd rather get poisoned. Not so British after all. If you're like me, then you're most likely not going to be royalty. Although being a prince would be pretty cool, I just don't have the pure bloodline to be royalty. But neither does the Queen of England. When you think of old Blighty and her royal throne, you think of pure British descent. But you'd be wrong. The House of Windsor is actually Saxe Coburg Gotha, which, if you couldn't tell, doesn't exactly scream tea and crumpets. The German sounding name became an issue in the early 20th century due to the First World War breaking out against two time war loser Germany. Britain needing to inspire its citizens to defeat Germany, which at the time it was really anyone's game. So, to help inspire the people, King George V changed the name to Windsor. After all, it's kind of difficult to fight someone when you have more in common than differences. Not to mention that there were a lot of Germanic influences around, so really, it was a bad look and a great marketing decision. At number nine, Charles the Tampon? Yeah, 
We're getting weird. Relationships are kind of weird. I mean, they can be great, don't get me wrong, but they have a weird side too. Every couple is different and they have their thing. Some have a show that they like to watch together, others have their songs, and some have little sayings that they've come up with. But those are the more tame quirks that some couples have. Others, however, can get very bizarre, but many of them probably can't add up to the strange things that have been said between Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles. As we all know, Prince Charles was first married to Princess Diana, and it's no secret that they had a pretty tough relationship. Theirs was certainly not a happy marriage, and they each had their own affairs with other people while they were married. During their marriage, Charles was still pretty hung up on Camilla, the woman he was told he couldn't have, and who was also married to someone else. This minor obstacle, however, didn't stop them from getting freaky, at least over the phone. In 1992, the year that Charles and Diana announced their separation, a steamy phone conversation between Charles and Camilla was leaked, and it was super weird. In the call, Charles was simping like no other, saying things like how he wished he could live in Camilla's pants as a pair of panties, and even expressed his desire to be Camilla's tampon. Like what? Charles, stop it. Ew. This leak became a scandal called Tampon Gate, and as you can imagine, this wasn't good for the royals. But I guess it still kind of worked out for Charles since after all that he finally got the girl he wanted and perhaps got to live out his dream of being a box of tampons or something. I don't know. I really don't want that mental image. Moving on. Number 8. Comrade Cousin? King George V and Tsar Nicholas II were rulers of vast empires in the early 20th century. You'd think the similarities between these two monarchs end there, but in reality, these two royal men were much closer than the public thought. Georgie and Nikki were first cousins. That's right, first cousins. Even though their respected empires were culturally different and separated by hundreds of miles, the two men were immediate family. Looking at images of the royals together doesn't require a DNA test to understand that they're related. They look identical and could easily be mistaken for twins. Unfortunately for Nicholas, when the Russian Revolution was in full swing, the Romanov family went into isolation after Nicholas abdicated his throne. While there, there were attempts to thwart the coup. Nikki's cousin wasn't the best aid. Just goes to show you that sometimes you can't rely on a guy who looks exactly like you because royalty has pretty messed up bloodlines. At number 7, Killer Date. What is the worst date that you've ever been on? What kinds of weird people have you met through your dating history? I'm sure there are some pretty wild and crazy stories out there, but I'm guessing that very few of them would even come close to the insane dating story from Princess Beatrice and how she literally dated a killer. In 2006, when Princess Beatrice was 17 years old, she got into a relationship with an American playboy named Paolo Luzo. Paolo was an arguably shady guy, judging by the fact that he was arrested on a manslaughter charge before getting with Beatrice. Paolo was accused of ending the life of 19 year old Jonathan Duchalier after beating the guy to death. Yeah. What a catch, right? Shockingly, Paolo's charges were reduced to a less severe charge, and he still got to date a princess after all of this. He even broke his probation to go on a trip to the French Alps with Princess Beatrice. How he finessed life so hard, I have no idea. But either way, their relationship only lasted a short amount of time. I can't say it's a good look for a member of the royal family to be seen with someone with such a dark past. Number 6. The Princess the tragic loss of Princess Diana affected not only the UK but people around the globe. She was known for her courage and her willingness to help those in need, and had the nerve to speak her mind. Her shocking demise isn't met without controversy. In fact, it may be the biggest controversy of the royal family. There is some evidence that points in the direction that the royal family was behind her death. Diana had proclaimed to her guards that her car was having issues and even stated in a private letter to her butler that she had some reasonable fear that her life was in danger. In a nutshell, the royal family disapproved of the princess's new lover, even though Charles had clearly been up to no good himself. So in order for Charles to remarry and stop the gutter storm and the tabloids that Diana was going to create, they maybe sort of organized the accident that did end her life. Well, good thing that's over. and. After this, there won't be any more controversy for the family, right? At number 5, Sucking Toes. The British royal family are considered celebrities. I mean, with the amount of time people spend obsessing about their every move, I'd say that they're 10 times more famous than the Kardashians. They don't need their own reality show for people to keep up with them. People just do it. With this obsession with the royals, obviously comes paparazzi trying to get the latest scoop on members of the family and what they do in their spare time, as well as who they're canoodling with. 
This was how Sarah Ferguson was exposed for seeing other men shortly after she and Prince Andrew separated. Sarah was photographed topless on a beach with a man named John Bryan, and it could have just been a juicy story by itself, but things got weird when pictures were published showing the man sucking on Sarah's toes. This again wasn't a good look for the royals, and the queen was pretty mad about the whole situation, but I'd like to look at the bright side of this. Think that this John Bryan guy had a pretty good time throughout all this. I mean, he got to suck royal toes and be published in the newspaper. Sounds like a pretty lit time for him. Number 4. Party Time British royals are people of high esteem, morals, and cut from a higher quality of cloth. So when members of the royal family are seen partying too hard, well, it's a bad look. Prince George, Duke of Kent, was one such royal. He became known for spending his evenings in the best hotels and ballrooms that money could buy, even sometimes wandering into venues that were a tad tawdry even by today's standards. What's more interesting than that is the prince living the life of a frat boy is that his promiscuous relationship with not only just women, but men as well. Add in substance abuse issues that would make Charlie Sheen blush, and you've got yourself one wild prince. Yet again, there's some private letters that seem to support such wild accusations. Unfortunately, he passed away in a plane crash that is shrouded in mystery, and the royal family is suspected of having a hand. Foreshadowing much? At number three, the milkman's son. By far the most scandalous royal relationship of modern times was without a doubt Prince Charles and Princess Diana's marriage. We all know how messy their relationship was with the love triangle, the affairs, and Diana's confessions of how tough it was to be married to Charles. But one of the other pretty juicy secret scandals that surrounded the couple was the speculation that the couple's youngest son, Prince Harry, wasn't even Prince Charles' biological kid. In a tell-all interview with Princess Diana in 1995, she admitted to having had a five-year long affair with a military man named James Hewitt. After Diana's passing, people started speculating that perhaps this James character was actually Harry's biological dad. I mean, when you take a side-by-side -side look at James and Harry, their resemblance is pretty uncanny. James denied all allegations, and the royal family did the same, but this still remains one of those royal secrets that I'm sure everyone believes, but just won't admit. Number 2. Step Bro? Yeah, I know it's gross, but the truth of the matter is, none of us would be here if it wasn't for a little inbreeding. Royals just tend to turn that dial up to 11. Back in ye olde times, bloodlines had to be maintained, and the only way to keep them pure was to marry cousins and have children. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip are both related to Queen Victoria, but the crazy bus doesn't stop here. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were first cousins, and they had nine children together. This is a tradition that all royal families practice. Of course, marriage back then was more of a business decision or a political one. It's why certain distant cousins end up ruling different monarchies and empires. Sure, I get it. Why cross the street when you can cross the hall? But at some point, you gotta run out of cousins. Let's just be glad this practice is of the past and stays in the past. At number one, long lost family. The royal family is known for trying to make themselves look perfect in the eyes of the public. They are always trying to look poised and put together and without flaws, but this effort also comes with its dark side. And there's a dark royal secret that just shows the lengths that they have gone to to make people think that they are all just perfect people of society. It turns out that the queen had secret cousins that very few people knew about. The royal family and everyone adjacent are very well known people, so how did we not know? about the queen's cousins? Well, that's because they were essentially shunned and shipped off elsewhere because of their mental states. Back in the 1940s, mental disabilities were not very understood and were often seen as embarrassing for the families of the people who had whatever disability. The royal family thought that these cousins, Nerissa and Catherine, were too embarrassing for the royal family to keep around, so they had them incarcerated in a mental institution and they remained there for the rest of their lives, cut off from the rest of the royal family. It is said that no members of the family ever came to visit them. Now that is not a way to treat family. 